disinformation, propaganda, conspiracy. These are not new things, though they are very now things. They are, in fact, very old things. In this episode of the Locofoco Netcast, the sound of the match lighting up signals the beginning of the podcast, we take a look at the possibility that the greatest story ever told might be a case of the greatest conspiracy ever sold. Yes, I'm referring to Christianity. My name is Timothy Verkula, and I've talked with Ralph Ellis now for the second time, and this time for three hours. It's a long discussion, there's a lot of information, and I really encourage you to give the ideas and the evidence a curious and cautious look. I've been going over the things that I've allegedly known all my life since I was raised as a Christian, and I certainly certainly read the Bible stories. I read the Bible many times, and I've just realized how confusing all the names are. That's one of the... <laughs> yes. I mean, even Jesus Christ, that isn't a name and a surname. That's a name and a title. Yes. Most people don't know what it means. Yes. If they're well-read, they probably know that Christ is Messiah. But they probably don't know it means king and anointed one as well, right? They probably don't get that far. And then there's the Lamb of God, and there's Emmanuel, there's the Son of Man, there's the Son of God, there's the Fisher of Men, is that right? And and I remember singing in Sunday school, um, he's the bright and morning star. Yes, he's Lucifer, yes. And that's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, why is he Lucifer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's St. Paul called the Apostle Paul, which is not a disciple, he's an apostle, so that makes it... For the kids, that was always confusing. What's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? And, you know, really, I don't think we ever got a very good answer in Sunday school, though we had a really good Sunday school. He's, he's an extra one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was also called Saul. But that's not all, right? He was called other things, even in the Bible. And uh, then there's uh, Vespasian, and his Vespasian Jr. Titus, I mean, you know, I mean, he wasn't called Vespasian Jr., but he has Titus was also a Vespasian, right? The son of Vespasian. Yes. Yeah. They had the same okay. names. Yes. Well, that's confusing. And all those Herods are confusing. <laughs> well, well, yes, and that, that, yes, that confused Doctor Carey completely. I don't know if you've come to that that bit. I'm uh, two thirds in, almost two thirds in. Right. To King Jesus, it's a fun book. The person who really stuck out at me this time in reading this book I mean, because I've read your basic thesis about Saul and Jesus well, in several books now uh, but the, the person who stuck out to me was Epaphroditus because hmm. here's an interesting person well I'm, I'm, yes. I'm an editor by trade and he was a secretary to Nero and he helped Nero die and that's a really <laughs> interesting tidbit he also was the owner at one point of the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. And that's something that you don't expect to find coming up when you also realize that two famous people dedicated their books to him. Mm -hmm. Well, at least somebody named him, right? That's, yes. So that's really interesting. Those people being the historian Josephus, as you write about, and the Apostle Paul, who talks, calls him my... What does he call him? He calls him a um, swordsman, or, or uh, he calls him... Fellow yeah, I think, soldier or something? Yes, his brother or something. Companion in labor, fellow soldier. That's what he said. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's awfully confusing. Uh, because you have all these Epaphroditus's. And the Wikipedia says they're likely different people. But when you realize they kind of had the same job, mm. then all of a sudden... And now it's at the same time... <laughs> Um, so we're not talking a generation earlier. Now it's the same time. Hmm. Yeah, it is a big hmm. <laughs> And then, by the way, and also, before we get too far into putting all those people together, Epaphroditus, 20 years after, after his contact with Josephus and other people, and, and, and Epictetus, apparently, because Epictetus, after the death of Nero, was, was, became a freedman. Then Epaphroditus was executed by Domitian, I think? Yes, I believe so, yes. So that man had an interesting life. 
And it puts everything back into real history as well. Suddenly we're joining up gospel history with real history, which they never want to do. Because if they do so, it leads them down a rabbit hole and they don't want to go down that rabbit hole. And so by all means, they have to deny that Epaphroditus was Epaphroditus. You can't even have the, the sawline Epaphroditus being the same as the Josephine one, let alone being the same as, as Nero's scribe, uh, who was also called Epaphroditus. Um, but you argue, and you quite convincingly, Josephus was with Nero's household yes. at the time of Epaphroditus. Yes, so that makes that a smoking time, yes. gun, kind of, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's probably where he met him, because um, uh, I mean, perhaps we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but um, Josephus would have been writing these texts in Aramaic, of course, and he could not speak Greek, not sufficiently to write a book. And this has confused almost every a uh, scholar I've talked to, including Richard Carrier, who ought to know better. But he says so in his preface that he could not write Greek very well. And that's why he used Epaphroditus to translate um, his books. And that's where I think he met Epaphroditus was when he went to Rome. And then, of course, he was employed by Vespasian to write these books, to write his antiquities and his, um, well, first of all, the Jewish war, of course. And he needed someone to translate those books into Greek because they were not having the desired effect. This is according to Josephus, because he sent his first books to Edessa, basically, to the Babylonian Jews beyond the Euphrates. And who are the Babylonian Jews beyond the Euphrates? That is Edessa. Um, and we'll come on to this because again we're getting ahead of ourselves people won't know what Odessa is perhaps um, but those books were written in Aramaic and he wanted then his fellow um, his fellow travelers in Rome and Greece to understand what went on in the Jewish revolt and that's when they were translated into Greek and we only have of course the Greek copies we don't have the original um, Aramaic copies so people might be wondering uh, why we're talking about Josephus and so on in this fashion. So perhaps we should start a little bit with the um, Saul and Josephus connection. A well-read person should know that Josephus was the major historian of the Jews. Yes. And uh, that's, that's what, most of what we know about the Jewish revolt and much of, well, I don't know if much of what we know about the ancient Jews is the result of him, because they seem to ignore quite a bit of that. But uh, but he's well known, and he's quite a character. Yes. And he was used to be in, the, in before the mid nineteenth century, anyway, for a long time in America, even. And most preachers had a copy of Josephus's works. Ah, ev everybody did, um, because you cannot understand the Old Testament, and you cannot understand the New Testament unless you have read Josephus at the same time. Uh, so every influential household, every wealthy household would have had a Bible because that was your primary book because they were very expensive. So the only book you bought was the Bible. And the, the book that went alongside it was the works of Josephus because he gives the, the background history to everything that's mentioned in the Bible. And, and just for listeners here who might not jo know Josephus, uh, he wrote his own secular copy of the, Old Test uh, yeah, of the Old Testament. So his Antiquities of the Jews follows the biblical story all the way through, but from a sort of semi-secular viewpoint, which is brilliant. It's essential because it gives you an alternative version to the... Old Testament story. So if you want to see what Josephus thought about the various events in the Old Testament, you can go to Antiquities and you can find out a, saw, uh, a more realistic 
um, pragmatic view of those same events. And I, like Josephus, uh, lots of people disregard him when they're doing this sort of theological research. I like him because his information came from an older source than we have in our current Old Testament. So his information came from the Torah that was from the time of the Babylonian exile. So we're talking about 600 BC here that he took from the temple in AD 70. So modern Torahs, again, people might not know this, but modern Torahs are only a thousand years old. Now, we know they're roughly according to how, you know, they haven't been changed that much because the snippets we got from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that they're more or less the same as they were uh, 2,000 years ago, but not exactly the same as they were 2,000 years ago. But we don't have any extant Torahs that are more than 1,000 years old. Whereas Josephus was working with one that is 2,600 years old. He has a much older, more authoritative source that came before any amendments that might have been made, <clears throat> uh, say, you know, during the Jewish revolt or any of those uh, uh, events that happened at that time or, um, or even the Bar Kokhba uprising. So he gives a very valuable confirmation of what was going on in the Old Testament and he does it in a secular format, so it makes more sense. It's not spiritual. Do you mean fewer miracles then, uh, or the miracles are explained? Yeah. What, what do you mean? They're, they're explained more. They're battles. They're not miracles and things of this nature. Um, you know, the uh, dispute between Jacob and his sons is explained more in terms of a battle, a dynastic dispute between kings, less of a, you know, father and son of, of two shepherds. It's more of a uh, large set piece battle. Um, so it gives the sense of these people being monarchs rather than just shepherds. And of course, we spoke about this in our last talk, where indeed they probably were because they were probably shepherd kings, the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. And Josephus seems to confirm that. And he does in other places as well. I can't quite remember. It's, it's, he, he wrote several books. Probably his book about Appian, where he's defending his sense of yes, history. Yes, against Appian, yes. Where he, he definitely links the uh, Hyksos and the Israelites as being the same people. So Josephus is essential. And that, that is why I'm pretty sure that down through the ages... Many people have seen what I have seen, especially with the New Testament text, because, of course, Josephus wrote his what I say is a secular version of the Gospels from the same era as the Gospels. Now, all of these people, ever since these books were translated into English, and uh, that was uh, about the 17th century in Britain, so we have an English Bible and we have an English translation of Josephus. Those books would have been on the shelves of um, many rich households. And they would have seen exactly what I've seen. It's not possible to read these two books side by side and not see the connection between the two. With his Wars of the Jews, his, his book about uh, the Jewish war, which was between AD 66 and AD 70. So everybody must have seen this, and they must have collectively looked at these two books and the connections between the two of them and said, I don't want to go there because it's too troubling, because it conflicts with everything that the church has told me. And I would probably get into trouble if I mentioned the similarities between these two books. And so I'm going to turn a blind eye, and I'm not going to look at the connections between these two accounts. So I think this has happened many times in the past, and I am only different in that I don't care about the ramifications. I'm quite happy to point out the similar similarities between these two books and suffer the ramifications of, of that connection. Uh, and of course, those the ramifications are quite profound if you are a Christian and believe in the, in the Christian story. Um, it doesn't change the story, 
the story is exactly the same, which I find very interesting. So we're not actually changing any of the well yes <laughs> sort of the story remains the same but the context is changed and and so again like we had with you know the poor shepherds in the old testament suddenly becoming shepherd kings we have the same effect in the new testament where um, the poor carpenter king suddenly becomes a real king and you can see how the context therefore changes. Um, so yeah, let's let's get into that, I suppose. And I think we should start with those connections between Saul and Josephus. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting theory. And I, I should maybe mention one more thing that I just discovered because I'm two thirds of the way into King Jesus, your book, is that not only do you identify Saul as Josephus, that is Paul as Josephus, you identify Josephus as not only inventing Christianity, but also kind of inventing rabbinical Judaism. The Judaism that we know today yeah. was kind of a product of him. <laughs> yes, that's that's an interesting one. Again, that's getting a little bit beyond us at present. So let's start with the connection with Christianity. Um, the first thing you need to know is that a lot of people don't understand that Christianity has nothing to do with Jesus. It is not the church of Jesus. It's the church of Saul. There were two main sects at this time. One was the church of Jesus and James, which was a Nazarene Jewish sect. They were most definitely Jewish. Even if they were sort of Gnostic Jews, they were slightly different to uh, Orthodox Jews. And then you have Saul's, uh, what I call simple Judaism. What happened is that Saul went out on these evangelical tours across the Mediterranean and he got beaten up on several occasions. People were not interested. He was supposed to be preaching on behalf of the Church of Jesus and James and people weren't really interested in this. The Jews, because they were obviously, you know, they were um, trying to persuade the Jews of the Mediterranean uh, to follow Nazarene Judaism and they were not interested. But he found that the, the, the Goyim, the, the, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, they were actually interested. This was all very interesting to them, especially, you know, we will come on to it in a minute, the knowledge of um, the procession of the equinox and things of this nature. And so Saul went to James and said, um, look, um, can I preach to the Gentiles? And James, for whatever reason, said yes. He said, look, here are the four rules of what I call simple Judaism uh, that you can preach to Gentiles. And they were, uh, you cannot drink blood, you cannot eat strangled animals, you cannot eat animals sacrificed to idols, and you must not indulge in fornication. Uh, by fornication, it means... Um, uh, I illegal forms of sex, you know, uh, there was a lot of incest and things of this nature. Uh, and they were the four rules of simple Judaism. And then on his second evangelical tour, Saul, St. Paul, went out and preached to the Gentiles. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles. And his church, which ended up being a church, grew more powerful than the church of Jesus and James. Uh, and there was a, a combat between the two, a contest between the two. And it was the church of Saul that won this contest. And that became Christianity. That's fairly clear from reading Acts. That's not really a shocking bit of information you've just given. I mean... No, but as a lot of people don't understand that difference, that anyone that is following Christianity is following the religion of the enemy of Jesus. They're not following the religion of Jesus. They're following his enemy. And that's rather shocking to some people that, that there is this division between the church of Saul and the church of Jesus and James. And there's a big uh, division. Now, that's sort of sort of glossed over in Acts because Paul pretends to sort of repent. I mean, he repents and, you know, he sees Jesus on the road to Damascus and he stops yes. persecuting Jesus. 
very interesting. So this gets very complicated timeline. In fact, I must say, reading the book, I'm having a great difficulty keeping the timeline making yes. any sense whatsoever. Well, the timeline has been altered, and that was probably one of the first things I saw um, when I started this research uh, in earnest, which was back in it was back in the early to mid nineties. I'd done research previously to that, which had been uh, it was useful. I, I'd been researching all of the similar names, for instance, that we have just been talking about, you know, where everybody at the crucifixion was called Mary, um, you know, things of that nature. I'd researched all of that. So I, I had a good b background in what the gospel text was saying. Um, but the first thing I noticed was there was um, – a disunity between the timelines in the Gospels and real history. And therefore, there was a connection between Saul and Josephus, which we'll come on to. And, and I mean, some of these are quite obvious. Um, there is the well-known ones where Jesus mentions the, um, the siege of Jerusalem. He mentions, uh, you know, the siege, the, the walls being thrown down, um, and um, weeping for the fate of Jerusalem. Oh, and a trench and a wall being built around Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened du during the Jewish revolt. But that didn't happen until AD 68. So, you know, why is Jesus talking about it? And then he mentions the death of Zacharias, who was very pointedly said to have died in the middle of the temple, between the altar and the temple. Well, we know exactly when that happened. This was uh, Zacharias Baruch, and he died in the middle of the temple, between the altar and the temple. Josephus writes about it. But that didn't happen until AD 68. So why is Jesus lamenting him? And then another one uh, that I've found that I don't think anyone else has found comes from the Talmud. And that's that Jesus mocks um, uh, Ben Zizit Hakeseth. And you might not know him from the uh, New Testament because he appears there in code. Uh, Jesus mocks these people who like their big phylacteries, their, their big tassels and their big you know, the boxes they wear on their heads in, in Orthodox Judaism and, and for their big cushions, their comforts in the temple. And the Talmud does exactly the same. But it mentions that this is a play on words for Ben Zizit Hakaseth, who is likewise being mocked for his, his uh, creature comforts. But this mockery didn't happen until AD 68. Hakeseth was one of the leaders of the Jewish revolt. So all the way through this New Testament, we get these pointers showing us that, hold on, this didn't happen in the AD 30s. It happened in the AD 60s. I mean, for instance, Jesus was jailed alongside revolutionaries who had committed murder in the revolution, as it says in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, well, what revolution? What revolt was there in the AD 30s? There wasn't really any significant revolt. The significant revolt was again in the AD 60s, and it was the Jewish revolt. So we have all of these pointers saying that the timeline is incorrect. And I even got it. I mean, this went on and on. I've got, you know, a list of, you know, nearly two dozen reasons um, why we should be looking at the 8060s rather than the 8030s. And this even went on to, in, in order of the books, the one you're reading now, uh, King Jesus, was uh, then followed by um, Jesus, King of Edessa, which was then followed by the Grail Cipher, which is my uh, revision of Arthurian legend. So a decade later, I'm reading Arthurian legend, and I find that in Arthurian legend, they have the same problem. 
they have the same discontinuity. I call it the um, chronological chasm, uh, where the timeline has been shifted by 40 years. And in Arthurian legend, Arthurian legend mentions the gospel story, of course, because the big hero of Arthurian legend is, confusingly, Joseph of Arimathea. So now we're back in the first century again, which is another confusion for another day, perhaps. But anyway. I often tell my friends and probably will be talking about to my audience one of my favorite novels or fantasies of all time, which is T.H. White's The Once and Future King. And when I read it at mm. age 16, one thing I noticed is The Once and Future King sounds an awful lot like Jesus. That is, you don't normally talk... <laughs> yes about a king coming back. Yes. And and it's never explained by T.H. White. It's it, that's sort of just left hanging there as this, as this title that makes almost no sense. Yes. But it does make sense when you refer it to the Arthurian legends. Because once again, is it I, I Joseph of Arimathea is... shows up in our in Arthurian legend and in the story of the Gospels. It's very odd. Yes. For no good reason, because there's supposed to be like 600 years between them. Um, yeah, it's and, and uh, thousands of miles between them, of course. Um, I, I think this has happened on many occasions. I haven't read that particular one you mentioned there, but I've, I've still got this inkling that Robin Hood is based on the same sort of mythology. The dispossessed prince who's trying to regain his realm. Uh, and Maid Marion, you know, Maid Mary oh is, is his. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sure there's lots. <laughs> there's lots in there. I've never got to grips with it and I actually produced a book about it, but I'm sure there is lots in there. If someone wants to research it, yeah, please do. I'm sure there, there are many connections there that they've just repeated the story again and again. And we, we, we will see this in, in this bit of research here that, um, yeah, they've repeated things. So. What happens in Arthurian legend? Ah, yes. Arthurian legend stumbles across the chronological chasm, the same as everybody does. If you mention the Gospels, you, you will come across this chasm, this 40-year gap between what the Gospels say and what appears to be happening in reality. And in Arthurian legend, they have a problem because they say that Joseph of Arimathea worked for Emperor Vespasian. Now that's a problem. He was a soldier working for Emperor Vespasian. That is a problem because we're talking about a different era here. So <clears throat> how do they overcome this era? This error? Um, well, after um, Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus down from the cross, he's jailed by the Romans. <clears throat> So he sits in jail and he goes to sleep for three days and he wakes up and 40 years have passed and he doesn't even realize it and he hasn't got any older himself. So now he can jump from the 80s, 30s and he can go to the 80s, 70s and he can be a soldier working for Emperor Vespasian. Those are the mm, oddities that you have to to deal with with this chronology because the chronology has been deliberately changed <clears throat> that's why jesus could be talking about the siege of jerusalem because we're actually talking about the ad 60s here we're not talking about the ad 30s and that sort of changes everything and from that and also <clears throat> I suppose I saw it immediately when I first started reading Josephus. There is a direct connection, as we mentioned, between Josephus and Saul. So every time I, I came across just reading about Josephus, I thought, well, I recognize that. Go back to the Old Testament, and, sorry, the, um, the gospel stories, and suddenly find, well, there's a connection there. There's a similarity. And I ended up with uh, a huge selection of similarities between uh, Josephus Flavius and Saul, St. Paul. And these included, well, you know, of course, they're both Roman citizens. They're both Jews. They both become rabbis. Um, 
all of their sort of uh, um, setting the scene is very much the same. But the, the one I liked was that they were both on the same prison ship being taken to Rome. So, uh, and the description in the gospel version is, is wonderful because I, I think we mentioned this before that it's a, a first hand um, observation and record of this ship. Um, so they board this ship. Um, it's called Castor and Pollux. So they even had a name for the ship, the same as we do now. And they set off, they went to uh, Cyprus first. And then they headed off down southwest and they got caught in a storm. And this ship is shipwrecked on Malta. And miraculously, they are saved. They, they come ashore in Malta, even though the ship is dashed to pieces. And the next season, they are able to travel to um, Naples to go and see Emperor Nero. Well, Saul does exactly the same. So Josephus and Saul are on this same ship. I mean, how many ships are shipwrecked in Malta um, in about the AD 60s? This would have been about uh, AD 62 or something of this nature. A prison ship that is involved in a huge storm and is wrecked on Malta. And then both of these people, both Saul and Josephus, uh, go to Naples and then travel up um, to Rome to go and see Emperor Nero. It's the same story. It's the same story. And not only is that interesting, but it explains the problems that we have with the New Testament accounts. One of the problems with the New Testament account is that we have Saul, who is obviously important because when he was imprisoned, he was visited by all the governors and the kings of the land came to see him and hear him speak. So this guy was obviously important. He was not a, you know, a two bit tinker sitting in jail. The aristocracy came to see him and tried to get bribes from him as well. So he was obviously very wealthy. They wouldn't be sitting there talking to uh, Saul and expecting bribes from him if Saul was not wealthy and influential himself. But what is not explained is how Saul was marching around Syrio-Judea, persecuting and imprisoning the Church of Jesus and James. Under what authority was he allowed to imprison people just because they were of the church of Jesus and James? You remember the cry, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting us? Um, that's not explained. Who was this guy? How was he able to do this? Well, if he was Josephus, we know exactly uh, how and why he could be doing this. Because Josephus was the army commander in command of Galilee. And he was indeed throwing people into jail. And curiously enough, the person that Josephus Flavius was persecuting in Galilee was Jesus. He names him as Jesus. He names him as Jesus, Jesus of Gamala which is an Edessan name. We'll come on to that later. So we have a, a, an exact connection between these two stories. Saul was persecuting Jesus around Galilee and, and, and Syria, you know, as, as far as Damascus, supposedly in the AD 30s. And Saul and Josephus Flavius was doing exactly the same. He was persecuting because he was the army commander in charge of Galilee, given that commission by the temple themselves, the temple priesthood. And he was persecuting this guy called Jesus of Gamala and trying to put it, in fact, he did put him in jail at one point, but he was released by um, Agrippa II. Um, there was lots of, hmm, it was a civil war. So, that, you know, nobody quite knew on which side everybody was. It's, you know, uh, civil wars must be the most confusing things of all. And of, of course, 
you know, there was an exact match there, which is what I wrote about in, in the King Jesus book that you're reading at present. But it went on because uh, then I was reading the Talmud and I came across this lady and I thought, well, that's very strange. And then I started reading Professor Robert Eisenman and his analysis of those same texts from the Talmud. And of course, Eisenman goes into great length in his, I think it's his um, James, the brother of Jesus book, I think, on this person called Jesus of Gamala. And of course, the interesting thing is that Jesus of Gamala marries Mary and Martha, both us. Simon Bothus. But Robert Eisenman demonstrates that Mary Bothus was Mary Magdalene because they both lived at the house of Simon, Simon Bothus. And of course, the Bethany sisters, sisters, they lived at the house of Simon. And there was Mary and Martha. And we have Mary and Martha Bothus. And Jesus of Gamala this person that was being persecuted by, I'll call him now Saul Josephus, the combined and conflated Saul Josephus. Um, Jesus of Gamala married Mary Bothus, who Robert Eisenman compares and um, proves is Mary Magdalene. Well, now we're back into the biblical text now. Because who is the supposed spouse of, of Jesus? She is Mary Magdalene. There is a complete match between these two stories. And the problem for Christians is that who is Mary Bothus? Because here, you know, essentially you could say uh, we have discovered the biblical Jesus in the historical record. He is Jesus of Gamala. Look, we found, you know, nobody has historical evidence. We have historical evidence. Here he is in the historical record. He is called Josephus, sorry, he is called Jesus of Gamala, who married Mary Magdalene. Well, Christians could do that, but of course they're not going to do that because there are several problems with that. Firstly, this happened in the AD 60s. So you've got to explain why Jesus is still alive in the AD 60s and he's not dead in the AD 30s. And the second problem is that Mary Bothus, i.e. Mary Magdalene, was the richest woman in Judea. This is a woman who had a dowry of one million gold denarii when she got married to Jesus of Gamala. In modern terms, I equate that to, if I remember correctly, it's about, I think it's about $6 billion was her wedding gift when she got married to Jesus of Gamala. Um, she was stupendously wealthy. She was the wealthiest woman in Judea. And this actually does make sense. We'll come on to why it makes sense later. But of course, you know, as a Christian, well, that conflicts with everything you've been taught. You know, this guy is supposed to be a, a poor carpenter. And, and Mary Magdalene is a, you know, a, a poor whore. OK, we have a dichotomy because he's called a king on 36 occasions. You know, why is a um, carpenter actually a king? Why is a poor whore able to anoint Jesus as a king using very expensive spikenard oil. That's a bit of a problem. You know, why was the guy anointed as a king of the Jews? So, yeah, the stories match, but the circumstances don't match. And that's why Christians have to deny that Jesus of Gamala has anything to do with, with the biblical Jesus, even though there are so many similarities between the two. Um, it's just not possible for them to compare the real Jesus with the uh, artificial, with the imaginary, with the fictional Jesus that they've created from this story. So I, I said somewhere in the book that, you know, if, if the real Jesus knocked on a church 
uh, or cathedral door, you know, the, the bishops would throw him out as being an imposter because that's not the Jesus they want to believe in. Um, and that's how much the, ch the story has been changed. But that's kind of, I want to say, droll. Because one of the things we hear over and over again is that, it's, it's, it, this is a sermon, is that if Jesus came back, we would reject him. <laughs> yes. okay, well, they would indeed. <laughs> so that's that's double. That's like a double-edged sword. That little sermon. So uh, <laughs> it cuts both ways. Yes. So yeah. So that was my discovery of um, the biblical Jesus in the historical record. The first discovery. Um, this is what I wrote in the book um, King Jesus. And there is lots of other evidence that, that su supports it. Um, so there's evidence, you know, from history, from the Talmud, from other texts that, that supports this. But the problem is with this discovery is you still don't know who Jesus was. Because, again, Jesus of Gamala, although, you know, we have him written in the historical record, we don't know who he was. Because he's not there in terms of archaeology in the region. We don't know who this character was. There are no castles and manor houses or anything else we can ascribe to this Jesus of Gamala guy. So he's almost... But last time you did mention yep. that there were discovered synagogues, I think you said, in the Galilean ah, region yes. that are uncomfortably yes. um, astrological. <laughs> <laughs> and that yes. they're mentioned as being kind of like Jesus's. Yeah, this is interesting because, again, people don't realize, I think we talked about this in the previous uh, um, talk, that the, the primary symbol of uh, Nazarene Judaism, at least, was the Zodiac. And all of these uh, synagogues have a large Zodiac on the floor. And it's a classical sort of Greek style uh, zodiac um, but we know it's uh, from a synagogue because it has the you know inscriptions at the bottom and at the top it has the temple of Jerusalem the shofar the ark of the covenant all of that sort of stuff um, so we know these are Jewish zodiacs and this has not been identified by other people but it's been identified by myself um, because I, I think I'm the first person to see this is that in the works of Josephus, uh, Josephus Flavius himself, because you know this is sort of autobiographical, bio um, Josephus is sent to Tiberius to go and destroy the images of animals there, because they're blasphemous, of course. So he goes four furlongs south of the uh, south gate of Tiberius to find these images of animals and the person who burns the synagogue the temple down in order that they're not discovered because they're blasphemous and you might be you know the punishment for for having these animals images of animals would be death so they burn down the the, the uh, temple and the owner of that temple was jesus of gamala the same guy we've been talking about and the interesting thing in modern terms is if you go four furlongs south of Tiberias, you will come to Hamat Tavira, which is the big zodiac on the Sea of Galilee. So they say um, in all of the literature that the, uh, the zodiac is fourth century. But I don't believe that because A, we have this story that connects these images of animals uh, with Josephus Flavius himself. So we're talking about the AD 60s and B that the, uh, the Zodiac is a processional Zodiac and it marks the turn of the first century in processional terms. So I think that this Zodiac was there. Maybe, a, you know, a new synagogue was, was built in the fourth century upon, you know, the same site, but, the the, um, the zodiac that we have there that, that you can go and see now today, um, well only just today, uh, is 
original first century and belonged to Jesus of Gamala, and it was Josephus Flavius that was trying to destroy it. And while I was there, this was uh, last time I was there was probably 10 years ago, I think. Um, it's so contentious that a group of Orthodox Jews came out from Jerusalem with pickaxes and tried to destroy it. Because exactly in the same fashion as Josephus Flavius, they didn't want these images of animals um, in this ancient synagogue. And so they were trying to wreck this um, this zodiac, which is a big shame. Luckily, they didn't get very far before they were stopped. But that's how contentious these these are. To this day, thousands of years later. Thousands of years later, yeah, they're still trying to destroy <laughs> this same zodiac. But interestingly, <laughs> and this is where it gets kind of fun and uh, should excite I think they should excite people because they they should be able to put some things together now. One of the big transitions in Christianity was, well, we saw a movie when we were young called The Sign of the Cross. And we think of Christianity as of the cross. And there's a lot of interesting things there. But the early Christians, we know, and that means even Christians know, did not use the sign of the cross. They used the sign of the fish. Yes, And we live in the age of Pisces, and it all began at the age of Pisces, and that temple, or that synagogue, marks the beginning of the age of Pisces, and that's really yes. interesting. All of a sudden, early Christianity makes sense. Yep. The other symbol they had was the anchor. So the main symbol of, of Christianity was a fish entwined around an anchor. Now that's odd, because that is the symbol of Emperor Vespasian. So again, we're back into the AD 70s here. Uh, the symbol of Christianity was the symbol of Vespasian. This is why, I, you know, one of many reasons why I say that <clears throat> Christianity, the Church of Saul, was promoted by Vespasian. Not the Nazarene Church, of course, that was being persecuted. Um, but Christianity itself, the Church of Saul, Josephus, that was being promoted by Vespasian as to counterbalance Messianic Judaism. What he wanted to do was destroy Messianic Judaism because they just started a, the Jewish revolt. And the last thing Rome wanted was another revolt on the eastern borders of the empire. And so they wanted a way of nullifying this uh, revolutionary Messianic Judaism. And the simple way of doing that was promoting this new form of Rome-friendly, simple Judaism, the Judaism formed by Saul Josephus. But it gets really complicated, and it's really hard to follow parts of the story because things did change mm. back and forth a few times, so it gets really weird. Maybe you should explain, where is Gamala? We understand where the Sea of Galilee is, but people don't know what Gamala is. Yes. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, Gamala is, is difficult because I'm, I'm not sure it's actually talking about Gamala. There is a Gamala in, um, in Judeo's uh, Jordan. So there are two. <clears throat> there is one that's now in Jordan that's called Gamala, Gamala of the Plains. Uh, and it was probably named after camels because a camel was called a Gamala. Um, and initially I looked at that city first as being the, um, the base of these people because, you know, Jesus of Gamala, he came from Gamala. Where is Gamala? Well, first one I found was in Jordan, which was the Gamala of the plains. And then there's one up in Judea near the sea of Galilee, which is a fortress on the top of a hill, which is also called Gamala. And they say it's Gamala there because it looks like the back of a camel. It's stuck on the top of a ridge. Again, we have this connection with camels. Uh, but in, in a later book, uh, I match these people up to the Edessan kingdom. And we'll come on to that in a minute. But the king there was called o Okama. And the G and the K are the same in Aramaic. Um, that they're intertwined. So a camel is either a, a Kamala or a Gamala. Um, and I now think that they're talking about Jesus Okama, 
the same as the Edessan kings are all called, well, most of them are called Okama. So what does Kama mean? Well, Kam, Kama in ancient Egyptian was the original name for Egypt. And so what I think it actually means is uh, Jesus of Gamala, it means Jesus of Egypt. And that gets it even weirder, because Josephus also mentions an Egyptian false prophet. False prophet. <laughs> and who is the Egyptian false prophet? It's as clear as day in the works of Josephus. He's mentioned in the Gospels as well, only once, I think, but he's mentioned in, in, in the Gospels. Um, it's clear. Uh, someone says, one of the Romans says, are you the Egyptian? the Egyptian false prophet. Um, I, I, I'll have a look at a, um, a reference for that. Um, but anyway, uh, within the works of Josephus, the Egyptian pro false prophet is the person who took the 5,000 out into the wilderness. Now, who took the 5,000 out into the wilderness? It was Jesus. Uh, it's quite obvious that, you know, the, the, the um, the Egyptian false prophet was Jesus himself. So he's being called an Egyptian. And if my translation of Gamala is correct, it doesn't refer to any town called Gamala. It's referring to Kamala, which was the original name for Egypt. I will just um, have a quick word search. Okay, very good. Uh, so... By the way, and I know this is going to sound weird, but um, I'm I'm a Finnish extraction. Like, I'm about 100% Finn, as much as Finnish as a person can be. And the Gs and Ks are the, pretty much the same in Finnish as well. My last name is Virkala, and Ala is the ending. Gamala is oh, yeah. a word in Finnish, and it means horrible. And uh, we, right. our vice president of the United States is Kamala Harris. Ah yes. So this is those little <laughs> horrible Harris. Those little things <laughs> pop up in fun ways. Now that's just accident, I gather. I'm, I'm hoping that's just accident. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But it is <laughs> one of those oddities of life that things keep on coming back up in odd ways. Uh, yeah. Well, here's the um, the quote from Acts of the Apostles, of course, and this mirrors the works of Josephus, of course, <clears throat> which is why. Excuse me. <clears throat> Which is why if you see any theological research, they will always say that the Gospels were not written down until the AD 70s. Why do they say that? Why couldn't anyone write this down in the AD 30s when it was supposed to have happened? Well, because the Gospels themselves mirror Josephus Flavius in his Wars of the Jews. There are loads of, especially in Luke, there are loads of extracts from, you know, apart from what we've been talking about before, about uh, Hakeseth and Zacharias all being AD 60s characters, a lot of the information comes out of Josephus Flavius's Jewish Wars, which was not written until about AD 72. So if you have Gospels that are copying from Josephus Flavius, well, they have to have been written in the AD 70s. And this is why they will say the Gospels are written in the AD 70s, because they mirror Josephus and therefore could not be written before. Um, but they don't sort of mention that. They just say, oh, we think, you know, there was 40 years of oral transmission before they were written down. No, they were written down at the time they happened by the person who was there, who was called Saul Josephus. Anyway, one of the... Um, many similarities between the works of Josephus and the Gospels is in Acts 21.38, uh, which mentions the Egyptian false prophet. And it says, Art not thou the Egyptian, which before these days made an uproar and led out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? Which is exactly what Josephus Flavius says. And of course, by murderers, they're talking about Sicari, as in Judas Iscariot, who was also a Sicari, the uh, dagger men 
um, of the Jewish revolt, um, an assassin. They, they had uh, small daggers under their cloaks and they used to mingle with the crowds and kill their enemies within the crowds and then sort of sneak away. So here, Acts of the Apostles is mimicking Josephus Flavius almost precisely with their description of the Egyptian false prophet who led 4,000 men out into the wilderness. Well, again, who was the guy who led 4,000 people out into the wilderness to be fed with loaves and fishes? Uh, it was the biblical Jesus, of course. So it's quite obvious that the Egyptian false prophet was the biblical Jesus. And, of course, that miracle with the loaves and fishes was not a miracle at all. We're talking about, uh, it makes it very clear uh, in both the Gospels and the Nag Hammadi Gospels, which have the same uh, text, the text about the Greek woman that um, Jesus calls a dog. Um, anyway, that, that verse um, specifically says that she wants the bread and Jesus will not give her even the crumbs from the table. Um, but in the Nag Hammadi Gospels, it's made clear that this bread means knowledge. So we're not talking about literal bread at all. We're talking about knowledge. She wanted the knowledge of the church of Jesus and James. And Jesus would not even give her the crumbs of knowledge because she was a Greek. Whereas Saul would, of course, because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. That was the difference. Um, <clears throat> so this miracle uh, of the loaves and fishes is actually the knowledge of the age of Pisces. That's what it's talking about. Most people who, let's say, have read Elaine Pagels or many of the main interpreters of Gnosticism think of Gnosticism mainly as a deeply mystical, anti-life, anti-reality kind of religion, as a very, as a very ethereal thing. And, and, uh, but you're suggesting here, and I think I've got it from a number of different places, is that the, that's how Gnosticism looked from the outside, because people wouldn't tell mm -hmm. them what the Gnosis was. From the inside, they were actually dispensing real information, things that could be yes. close to the truth, like the age of Pisces. Yes. Well, Gnosis means knowledge, of course. That's what they were passing on. But uh, the Gnostics are the people who know. But the way... Whereas the Agnostics, which we have today, are the people who don't know. Yeah. I must say that by default, I'm often just an agnostic. Uh, but Because I don't know a lot of things. Uh, but this idea that Gnosticism is actually only about a sort of spiritual satori, that is only about enlightenment on the sense of myth, sort of the kind of Jordan Peterson kind of stuff. Jordan Peterson yep. seems kind of like a Gnostic these days. Uh, I mean, he, Christians yes. love him, but they'll love anybody who takes their text seriously these days. They're so beleaguered. Uh, but but you're talking about something different. Uh, to me, that this, this kind of Gnosis here is actual real knowledge, almost scientific knowledge. Yeah, it is. And that's the difference between myself and Richard Carrier, who doesn't seem to understand any of this whatsoever. He, he takes it all in terms of Myth, mythology. Uh, even Peterson, who I, I enjoy, his talks are really, really good, but uh, he is reading far too much into the texts. I mean, he, he takes one text, I think, about Cain and Abel, and he does two hours of a talk on four lines of texts. You can't read that much into these texts. You're, you're over-egging the pudding, as it were. <laughs> there is too much um, in, in your explanation. It's more simple than that. You, you have to balance your thoughts against reality. And, and my ambition all the way through this is not to look at the mythology, but to look at the history. And so I'm just trying to... Uh, put these texts back into the historical record, compare the events with historical events, and that is almost as far as you can take it. And yes, it is written in code, 
all of the Talmud is written in code. I mean, the whole thing is just a code book from end to end. But it has to be simple, otherwise people couldn't understand it. You can't have all of these, um, you know, uh, people are into numerology and and they find all sorts of correlations with the distance, you know, in miles to Sirius and things like this. And you're going, hold, you're you're just extrapolating too much. You know, most of this is fairly simple. Um, You know, the nicknames they chose and the events they're describing have to be simple because you have to be able to pass these on to your fellow initiates. And so like I talk about Bar Kamsa, uh, I'm not sure if you've come across him yet in, in uh, that book. Is he in that book or on the next one? He might be in the next one. Um, but Bar Kamsa is a character in the Talmud the leader of the Jewish revolt. So we're coming back to this Jewish, everything revolves around this idea of the Jewish revolt. And the Talmud, for some strange reason, blames it on Bar Kamsa, the son of Kamsa. Well, I mean, nobody in the world knows who Kamsa is. He's just not there. He's he's not there in Jewish history. He's not there in real history. He's he's nowhere. Well, but Bar means something. Bar means son of. Yeah. So we have Kamsa. They actually say in the text, there is a Kamsa. The the temple was destroyed by a Kamsa and a Bar Kamsa. So Kamsa the the father and Bar Kamsa the son. So we're talking about a father and son, um, one of which was pro keeping peace with Rome and Bar Kamsa the son who wanted war with Rome. Okay, so the leader of the Jewish revolt was Bar Kamsa. And if you look into the works of Josephus, of course, the leaders of the Jewish revolt were the princes of the kings of Edessa. And we'll come on to Edessa in a minute. So there's there's a link already with Edessa. Um, so what is this Bar Kamsa? Who is Kamsa? Well, it's it's a very simple uh, hypochorism. It's, it's, it's a nickname. And they do this all the way through the Talmud is they change the names into something humorous or um, something from something historical from from the Old Testament in order to cover up who they are talking about. Because the Jews had a problem. Remember this Talmud. um, These sections in the Talmud were written by uh, Yohanan ben Zakkai who was the leader of the Jews after the Jewish revolt from AD 70 onwards. Well, they had a problem because they were subservient to everyone almost by that time. They were subservient to Rome. Of course, Rome was the victor in all of this dispute. And they were rapidly becoming subservient to Christianity because early simple Judaism Christianity was being promoted by Emperor Vespasian. So they had to be careful about what they said. They couldn't be seen to be criticizing Rome. They could not be seen to be criticizing Christianity. And so they wrote a lot of their history in code. Thus, we get Bar Kamsa. Uh, What does Kamsa mean? Kamsa means locust. And all the way through my research on Odessa, which we will come to in a minute, I keep finding that these characters are called locusts. And the famous one, of of course, is in Acts of the Apostles, where the famine relief given to Jerusalem in AD 47 was by Agabus. And Agabus means the locust. And it's a play on words with King Abgarus of Edessa. We're back to Edessa again already. Um, so it's quite clear that the Edessan monarchy, Abgarus being called Agabus, they were being called locusts. And the Edessan monarchy started the Jewish revolt, just as Bar Kamsa started the Jewish revolt. And he was also being called a locust. Why? It comes out of the Old Testament because the Edessan monarchy came from the East. So they are the perfect analog of the locusts of the plagues. 
during the plagues, the locusts came out of the east and they destroyed um, Jerusalem. Sorry, they destroyed, yeah, Egypt and, and Jerusalem. They were in Egypt at the time. So they came out of the east and they destroyed Egypt. And so what they're saying is that the Edessan monarchy are the locusts that came out of the east and they destroyed Jerusalem. They're just making a very simple uh, analogy with, with biblical history. Uh, and that's, that's as far as you can take it. You know, that, that is the, um, the code within the Talmud. You don't have to look at it any deeper than that. You can't write, you know, 50 pages on why Kamsa is called Kamsa. It's very, very, very simple if you understand the code. Um, and that's what you have to do when reading these books. You have to understand what they're talking about. And as I've said, you know, Acts of the Apostles does exactly the same thing. It changes Abgarus into Agabus, the king of Edessa. Yeah, I think Jordan Peterson is on another wavelength from what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, he's, I, I think he's trying to explain why the myth won. In a sense, what you can say is that he's explaining why the propaganda won. Because it reached human beings on this certain level and on, on the level that Joseph Campbell talks about and all that stuff. But he's not talking about yeah. the reality of, of any of the stories. No. He doesn't care about yes. that. He literally has no interest in yeah. it. I have written to him, and I, I, I'm not sure if I managed to get through because it's very difficult, especially after he had his illness and so on. It's very difficult to get through to him. But I would like to him to analyze the history as well as um, all of the... Uh, fiction behind these um, texts as well. It would be quite interesting. Yeah, I I found him a little... I really have enjoyed his uh, the few that I've listened to about the early Bible stuff, but you know, I know so much of the competing theories about where all this comes from, from Sumer and from Egypt, that it, mm. it, it he doesn't address any of the interesting stuff, because there's a lot of interesting history, and you might say competing paradigms for explanation that yes. he doesn't get to it all. And it just and after a certain point, it just becomes vexing. Yes. Yeah. He's only seeing half the story, even maybe not even half. Yeah. He's seeing, he's, um, he's kind of seeing the non-story. He, he, yeah. he, he's interested yeah. in the non-story of what's going on. And that's a, I guess that's a legitimate thing to do, but it's not what somebody who really wants to know what happened. Yeah. It's divorced from the real history. Yeah. And, and that's what I've concentrated on all the way through is just the real history, uh, connections with history. We've talked now in uh, two sessions for over three hours, and uh, it seems all roads are leaving to, leading to Odessa. And maybe you should get <laughs> yeah. to Odessa. Maybe we should get there. Maybe we should. <laughs> and the first thing listeners, uh, viewers will, will notice is they probably don't know what Odessa is. So we're not talking about Odessa in Greece here. That's a completely different city. We're talking about Odessa, uh, which is actually in modern Turkey. It used to be in Syria. Um, so we're talking something north of Aleppo. It's called San Lurfa at present in, in Turkey, but it used to be called Odessa. It used to be called Antioch Odessa. Why do we want to talk about Odessa? Well, because I was led there. I, I wrote this book called Queen Helena because it was a book about Queen Helena. And then halfway through the research, it just changed tack completely because I discovered Edessa. When I started the book, this is the book called Jesus King of Edessa. I had never heard of Edessa when I started this book. And then halfway through the research, the whole plot shifted <laughs> completely. And I ended up writing about Edessa because it became central to the gospel story. Um, and it's there in the gospel story, but you, you would never know it. Yeah, it's well hidden because I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been deleted. You see, if, if you do a computer search of the works of Josephus, Edessa was one of the wealthiest, well-connected monarchies in the first century. Josephus Flavius writes everything about everybody in the first century. And you can do a computer search of his works, type in Edessa, and it'll go, uh-uh, nothing found. Type in Abgarus, who was the king of Edessa, uh-uh, nothing found. 
it's been deleted from history completely on the command of Vespasian. It was done deliberately. It was not that, you know, for some reason, Josephus didn't know anything about uh, Edessa because he names their princes as being the leaders of the Jewish revolt. We'll come on to that. Um, so why has this city been and this monarchy been deleted from history? Well, because it was connected with a biblical gospel story. This is why we have in Acts of the Apostles, we have the prophet, I think he's called uh, Agabus, uh, who is predicting the um, and, and giving famine relief for the famine in Judea, which was probably the AD 47 famine. And he's being called Agabus instead of Abgarus. And the interesting thing about that is we have this direct connection with the gospel story because the money was taken from Abgarus, who's the king of Edessa. It was taken to Jerusalem by Saul and Barnabas. So Saul, our favorite character, Saul Josephus, was taking this famine relief money uh, down to Jerusalem. He was the ambassador of Edessa himself. Josephus was the ambassador to Edessa. And yet he never mentions it. Uh, there's something funny going on here. There's something very funny going on here. Might say fishy. And that's what I start. Might mm -hmm. say fishy. For the age of Pisces? Very, yes, very, very Piscean, yes. <laughs> um, so that's what I had to discover. And I discovered it by looking at the history of Queen Thea Musa Orania, who's another monarch that nobody will probably know about because she's been largely deleted from history as well. In fact, she was thought to be fictional until people started discovering her coins. Um, anyway, to cut a, a long story short, there was a lost daughter mentioned by Cicero of Queen Cleopatra. And this lost daughter doesn't get mentioned again. She disappears from history. But then later on, um, in the next emperor, um, Augustus, uh, Octavian Augustus, he is sorting out, he's just come to the throne, as it were. He's sorting out his borders, you know, to try and secure the empire of Rome. And so he gives to Yuba II, who's the king of Mauritania, North Africa. He gives him the daughter of Queen Cleopatra as a diplomatic bride. So he got Cleopatra Selene, who's a known daughter of Queen Cleopatra. And they made this very successful monarchy, subservient to Rome, of course, you know, a client kingdom of Rome. They made this very successful monarchy in North Africa. They've got an enormous great tomb there. The tomb, funnily enough, it's called the tomb of the Christian lady, which is the tomb of um, Cleopatra Selene. And I think it's in, um, I think it's in Algeria. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, do you want to interrupt, ask a question? Is Selene a reference to the moon? Yes, yes. So um, the uh, the children were called um, the sun and the moon. The two two children from um, Mark Antony. So her two children from Mark Antony were called the sun and the moon, um, Helios and and uh, Selene. Um, but uh, Octavian had another problem, which was his eastern borders. And Rome had already lost three armies to the Parthians. Uh, I, I will tend to call them the Persians, but Parthia had been taken over by Persia had been taken over by the Parthians, and it was now the Parthian Empire. But you could think of, of it as Persia. And Rome had lost three armies to these Parthian Persians over the last, mm, you know, 50 years or whatever. Um, Mark Antony lost an army there when he invaded um, Parthia. 
So he had to sort out this eastern border. So what does he do? He gives the king of Parthia, who is uh, Phraates uh, the fourth, and he gives him a concubine, a prostitute. And you're going, hold on a minute. That's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the minor king of North Africa gets a daughter of Cleopatra, a goddess, no less. She was, you know, Selene. She was uh, an incarnation of Isis. But the, the mighty king of Parthia gets a prostitute. No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So who was this strange gift from uh, Octavian? Well, she was Thea Musa Orania. And she became the queen of all Parthia. So she became his, I mean, he had many wives, of course. She became his chief wife. He was so impressed by this gift. She became his chief wife. So who was this Thea Musa Orania? Well, for many reasons, and I go through these in the book, this is in um, Cleopatra to Christ. She was the lost daughter of Cleopatra. It's the only explanation possible. That's why she was such a valuable prize. She again was a goddess. She was an incarnation of Isis. Um, and so we move on. She became the queen of Persia. And we move on 20 years. This was yeah, approximately something like 20 BC. She became the queen of Persia. So we move on 20 years to about uh, 2 BC. And she kills her husband. She has him poisoned. And then she marries her son, who's called Phraates V, or Phraates. It was probably a diplomatic marriage, although it might have been a real marriage. But she needed a male heir in order to become, you know, to stay the queen of, of Persia. Um, but the Persians weren't very impressed with this, um, with, you know, the disposal of their king. And so in AD 4 they're kicked out of Persia. And now we have the nativity story from the Gospels. What is the nativity? I mean, the nativity story never made any sense whatsoever to me. And I couldn't work out what on earth it was talking about. Because what we have is a king. Jesus was called a king on 36 occasions in some sort of exile, without a palace, in a state of poverty, somewhere in Judeo-Syria. And the Persian Magi come to his birth. Why would the Persian Magi, the three kings, why would the Persian Magi come to the birth of a poor carpenter, Jew, in Judea? It makes no sense at all. What's the connection with Parthia, with Persia? Why are the kingmakers of Persia interested in this birth? Makes no sense whatsoever. But in terms of Queen Thea Musa Orania, it makes every sense. She was kicked out of Persia in AD 4, just at the right sort of time. She's now without a palace, in some sort of exile, in a state of semi-poverty because they don't have a palace to live in perhaps in a stable, because that's all the uh, accommodation they can find, and a daughter of hers, because it would have to be a daughter, I think at this point, not Thea Musa herself, um, has a child who is now a potential heir to the throne of Persia. Now we know why the Persian Magi would be interested in this birth, because it's a birth to a prince of Persia, not only a prince of Persia, but a prince of Egypt through Cleopatra, Greece through Cleopatra and Rome through Caesar himself. Well, what we have here is, is the most influential and connected prince in the whole of the world connected to all of the empires of the known world, being born in a state of poverty somewhere in Judeo-Syria. Now, that's worth writing about. 
and that is the nativity story. That's where it comes from. And that explains all of the problems that we have with the, the nativity story. And where did these refugees go to? They went to Odessa. They founded Odessa in the first. I mean, it, Odessa was a, originally a, a city. It was founded by um, uh, Antioch, the, um, one of the commanders of uh, Alexander the Great. But it was just a regional city, and they made it into a city-state. So it was expanded into a powerful. But it has a weird history behind it, for it's just a few miles away from Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and the Magi was an ancient group of people. I mean, if we're let's talk about the same Magi that I know about, they're related to star worship, and uh, they may even precede Zoroastrianism. Yes, and that that is an interesting point, because I didn't even know that until I went to Odessa, and I suddenly found that Gobekli Tepe was just outside the, outside the town. I think, well, that's very strange. But the problem with that connection is that Gobekli Tepe had been covered with earth; it was not visible. It was completely covered. So if there is a connection with Odessa, you have to ask yourself, was it uncovered in the first century AD and was it covered up by the Romans and not covered up in antiquity, as archaeologists say? Now, I looked into this uh, and I, I, I don't know one way or the other, but the archaeologists said they know it was covered up in an antiquity because in the rubble, when they took the, the, the earth and the rubble away, they could find um, artifacts of antiquity. Yeah, but if you are just taking earth from the surrounding region and piling it on the top of Gobekli Tepe in the first century, you will be piling in objects of antiquity within that earth because you're not sifting it before you put anything there. You're just chucking everything onto Gobekli Tepe and covering it up. So was it covered up by the Romans because they didn't want, you know, the power and influence of Gobekli Tepe because it was associated with Odessa and the Odessa monarchy? And I, I don't know. I don't know the answer and, to and that. And Haran is right there too, right? And Haran is there. It's the uh, Haran is where Abraham was supposed to have come from. And he obviously went down into Egypt, but he came from Haran, and Haran is only 20 kilometers south of Odessa. So that's it's right, right. That's there. odd too. And Haran is, has has reverberations throughout our culture to this very <laughs> day. Yeah. It, it's the very foundation of the Old Testament is Haran, and Haran is at Odessa. So it's it, this yeah. is one of those things that where everything starts tying together in ways that kind of boggle the mind. Because, you know, it does. because I'm a modern. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to pretend to be, I'm not a postmodern, and I'm not, a, I don't think in ancient, in ancient ways at all. I'm just a modern person, you know, right out of the Enlightenment. That's the kind of thinking that I've always done. And everything's supposed to be separate and atomized in our thinking, right? We, we put things in neat little categories, and that's not connected to that, I mean, because those are separate things. That's kind of one of the things that modernists do, is that we split things apart, and if we do end up putting things together again, we're lucky. And uh, that's kind of my analysis of the, the modernist, postmodernist problem, is to what extent do our analyses ever synthesize? Uh, that's just one of my philosophical obsessions. Uh, but, but here we come to a problem, is that we're talking about a kingdom that you discovered and none of us know anything about, that was really important to the story that all of us know about. And it goes all the way back to the beginnings of civilization. And when we're talking to the beginnings, yeah. we're talking at the end of the Ice Age. Because there's Gobekli Tepe that was started at the end of the Ice Age. Yeah, yeah. During the Young Jars. Right. Yeah, dry what an era. astounding yeah. thing. We have links all the way back to real, ad now being better understood prehistory. That's being now incorporated into our thought. This is all pretty yes. heady stuff. Uh, yeah, and it, it sort of gets worse as well. It gets worse. Okay, tell me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or better, whichever, whichever way you want to, to look at it. Um, yeah, I was just... Um, I was just looking something up because um, there's something we 
need to look at as well. Um, this is just a demonstration that Edessa was known about, um, but it has been deleted by Josephus, deliberately deleted because he didn't want you to know what it was, where it was, uh, who lived there. So we know there is something fishy going on with this Odessa place. <clears throat> and this comes from, this is the story of John the Baptist. So uh, John the Baptist was complaining about a marriage for uh, Herod Antipas. Um, <clears throat> Herod Antipas was married to the daughter of uh, Aretas, the king of um, Petra. Uh, but he fancied, um, oh gosh, what was her name? For some reason, I forgot her name. Anyway, he was uh, Herodias. Was that a mother or the daughter? I forget. Um, he wanted to divorce um, the daughter of uh, King Aretas and marry this other lady. And that was illegal um, in Judaic law, in Mosaic law, which is why John the Baptist complained about it and why his head got lopped off and taken on a platter um, to the daughter. Anyway, that's the background. So there was this dispute, this, this divorce. Obviously, King Aretas was, was rather upset that his daughter had been spurned and <laughs> sent back to Petra. He was not very happy about this. And so he sent an army up to Judea to engage with Herod Antipas and have a war with him. And we have, luckily, this is, this is why I didn't know much about this before and how I was able to turn this into one cohesive story, is that we have two versions of many of these events. We have Josephus's version, which is obviously a, a Rome-friendly version, um, which has all the biases of you know, the uh, Flavian emperors. And then we have the Syriac version. Uh, this is by um, Moses of Corinne. Now, the Syriacs were different because they were, um, they got um, um, cut off from the rest of Christianity behind the uh, Council of Nicaea in, in the um, third century, no, the fourth century. And they got cut off behind the Council of Chalcedon in the uh, fifth century. And they got cut off from uh, Western Christianity behind the Iron Curtain of Islam in the seventh, eighth century. And so the Syriac church was completely divorced and separate from uh, the Western Roman church. And whatever they were deciding to do in Rome, they had no control over what they were doing in Syria. And so they developed um, different traditions and different histories. Um, why have I lost that? I had a quote here and the quotes just disappeared. Now, most people, and when I say most people, I say that with confidence because I'd never heard of any Syriac historians. Uh, these aren't well known. They're probably they're not in the lobe editions. There, this is this is all very different stuff. Uh, how did you track these guys down? Yeah, well, I was there, of course, in in Syria because I didn't really know about um, Moses of Corinne. Um, but when I went out to uh, Syria, I discovered this. alternate history from sorry i'm just scanning down because i've lost my quote here I'd, I'd like to quote if i could i shouldn't have changed this should i as soon as i hit something on on the screen um the the page i was looking for disappeared um and for some reason it's not behaving itself anyway it, I'll, I'll find it in a minute here it is so yeah i was out in syria and i came across the historians that were active in 
uh, Syria. So um, I forget when Moses of Kareem was around. I think he's sort of ninth century or something of that era. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, he was writing the history of Syria, which includes, of course, the history of Edessa and biblical history, because he was a Christian, of course, so he was writing biblical history, but he was doing it from uh, a Syriac perspective, not a Roman perspective. And therefore, he was able to write about things that Rome had made taboo. And one of the things that Rome had made taboo, taboo was the monarchy of Edessa. So we have this story about this battle between the king of Petra, Aretas, and one of the tetrarchs in Judea, who was Herod Antipas. And Josephus writes about this. This is um, Josephus Flavius. And he says, uh, so Aretas made enmity between him and Herod Antipas. So they prepared for war. And when they had joined back, Battle, all of Herod's army was destroyed by the treachery of some fugitives who joined with Aretas' army. In fact, he says more than that, some fugitives from Syria who had joined with Aretas' army. Okay, so Aretas was assisted by troops from the north, from troops from Syria. So who were, and he calls them fugitives, for goodness sake, you know, we, we can see the problem here. <laughs> um, the duplicity in Josephus's account, he's calling these people fugitives from Syria. So who were they? Well, if we read the exact same texts in the book by Moses of Kareem, uh, he says, King Abgar, Oh, okay. Now we have a name. <laughs> so Josephus doesn't give us the name. Moses of Kareem does because Moses of Kareem was a, an Armenian and these Edessan kings were considered to be Armenian kings by the Armenians because they ruled Armenia. Um, so Moses of Kareem says, King Abgar allied himself with King Aretas, the king of Petra, and gave him some auxiliary troops to make war upon Herod Antipas. Being sharply attacked, Herod's troops were defeated, thanks to the help of the brave Armenians. <laughs> okay, now we can see the duplicity in, in the works of Josephus. So Josephus will not mention the king, he will not mention Edessa, and he calls them instead fugitives from Syria. We, we can see the changing of this history to suit his Roman um, paymasters um, because it was Rome that was paying for his books. And so what Rome wanted, Rome got. And Rome didn't want anyone to mention King Abgar of Edessa, who in this case formed an alliance with Aretas and made war upon Herod Antipas in Judea. And these, of course, by Moses of Kareem, are called the brave Armenians <laughs> because King Agbar was the um, king of, of Armenia, of course, as well as um, his own city-state. So, yeah, we end up with this unknown place because it's been deleted from history um, called Edessa. Now, what I discovered was that Josephus Flavius does mention Edessa, but he does so in code. So all the way through the works of Josephus, we have this, the Jewish war, according to Josephus Flavius, was started by the Babylonian Jews from beyond the Euphrates. Well, who who are they? You know, why why are the Babylonian Jews coming from Babylon to start a war in Judea? Um, and he calls them the kings of Adiabeni, King Monobazus uh, of Adiabeni, and and uh, everybody says that this is Arbela, which is you know it's near Mosul in Iraq, and I could not find any uh, reference to this. Um, there is no archaeological evidence. There's no historical evidence to say that Arbella was Adiabeni. 
And the stories they tell about this place just don't make sense. Um, so they say that the Romans go down to Adiabeni and they conquer this and they become uh, Parthica, the kings of Parthica, of Parthia. Well, sorry, but you don't just take a Roman army and stroll down to Mosul without engaging any of the Parthian troops because the Parthians were the, the nemesis of the Romans. They were the strongest army in the region. You just don't walk into Parthia without coming across the Parthian army. And so it didn't make sense to me. And so what I eventually discovered is um, Adiabeni is actually Edessa. And that seemed fairly obvious to me. Um, and then later on, and this, I like the way these things back each other up um, later on. So I had this idea that Adiabeni was Edessa. And then later on, when I'm reading Moses of Corinne, I find that the queen of Adiabeni, who is the famous Queen Helena, she was the queen, the wife of King Abgarus of Edessa. Well, hold on. Now we have the connection. Um, and, you know, you've only got two options. Either she was the queen of two separate city-states, which is sort of unlikely, or Adiabeni is Edessa. And that's much more likely because, uh, well, first of all, there is no mention of Edessa within the works of Josephus, whereas he does mention Adiabeni on many occasions. And there's no archaeological evidence whatsoever for Adiabeni, but there is plenty of archaeological evidence for Edessa and the kings of Edessa. Um, and so what he's done is he's renamed Edessa and he's relocated it down in Iraq to divorce Edessa from anything to do with biblical type history. But it's quite apparent that they are the same city. So now if we translate Adiabeni into Edessa, we can sort of rework his history of the Jewish revolt because the leaders of the Jewish revolt were the kings and princes of Adiabeni. Well, okay, now we know that Adiabeni was Edessa. So the, the, the leaders of the Jewish revolt were the kings and princes of Edessa, which is a real city with real monarchs. We have their coins. We know who they are. Um, well, they're not mentioned very, very much, of course, but luckily we've got some archaeology, which does prove that they had, um, you know, large palaces uh, over in Edessa. Is that anywhere near Palmyra? Palmyra is, is further south and further to the east. But yes, um, I think they set up Palmyra as a city-state as well. So that was owned by the same kings. When they were thrown out of um, Persia, I thought they came out in a state of poverty. But it seems from later research that they came out of Persia on their own terms. And so they came out of Persia with 200 courtiers, 600 mounted cavalry, and half of the Persian treasury. They were the richest monarchs in the region because they had just walked out with the Persian treasury, which was now based in Edessa. And I think they used some of that money to set up um, uh, Palmyra, which is out in the western desert of Syria which only suddenly became a, a wealthy and influential city in the first century. And for no good reason. There was no reason for this sudden flourishing of this desert oasis into one of the sort of wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire. It just doesn't make sense. You know, there wasn't the trade or the agriculture or whatever else uh, to make this into a big famous city. But it could be if the Edessans owned it. My uh, listeners might be interested in making connection here because Palmyra was the inspiration for Volney's The Ruins of Empires. 
Okay. And yes. uh, and that's a and that's a book that has been talked about on my channel because it's a bit of forgotten liberal history. Uh, very right. forgotten. It was once once again one of the most popular books among the intelligentsia of the 19th century that almost no American or European has ever heard of. Mm. Uh, and so, and this is, and it was inspired by Volney sitting in the ruins of Palmyra. And of course, Pal Palmyra um, eventually had Queen Zenobia. And that's interesting because she tried to do exactly what I say that the Jesus character tried to do. She tried to take over Rome from Palmyra. And that's part of the Heliogobulus she, business? The, Is that part of the, the Heliogobulus business or no? No, I don't think so. No. Um, because he came from the, from the East and actually r ruled as a Roman em emperor at one point. Uh, he was a sun, oh, a sun yes, king. Yes, sorry. I, I, yes. Elagabalus. Uh, yeah, I understand I, now. I'm, my... My my pronunciation is is slightly different of that king. Um, yes, he was from Odessa. Uh, he was from Palmyra as well, wasn't he? I think so. Um, I can't quite remember just offhand how he fits in, but yes, there is a, a king of that nature who came from um, uh, from Odessa slightly later or earlier than Queen Zenobia. I can't remember, but anyway, Queen Zenobia is very much like these very influential queens that spring from this Edessan empire because we've been talking about King Abgarus of Edessa, but the, the peculiarity with this, this particular monarchy was its powerful queens, not its powerful kings. So we have Queen Cleopatra herself, very powerful and influential monarch. We have Queen Thea Musa Orania, most powerful monarch in that region, controlled the whole of uh, Parthia. Uh, her daughter, I believe, was Queen Helena, the very famous Queen Helena uh, of Judea and Syria, who had the largest palace and the largest tomb in Jerusalem. She was the queen of Judea. Again, she's not mentioned very much. People don't want to mention that the Jews were ruled by a queen in, 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 in the AD 40s and 50s. But she became the de facto queen of Judea um, in the AD 40s. And she, I say, was, was the mother of the biblical Jesus. Um, and then we have Queen Zenobia, who comes from the same region, the same city, uh, who tried to do exactly the same as the Jesus character and take over the throne of Rome. And I have another question. Now, this is maybe just something that you've occurred, occurred to you when you've thrown it out, but it's occurring to me right now and that's <laughs> the story of the three kings the magi giving gifts is that the story yes. of the transfer of the wealth that they took from parthia it could be um i mean gift giving is is very prevalent in these ancient cultures anyway but it, it could be a mention of that yes that that is part of the wealth that came out of um uh, Parthia with them, but it, it it is obvious that they came out with a great deal of wealth because they came they became the richest people in this region. Uh, they became the buffer state between Rome and Parthia. That was the whole reason they were, were set up there. This was deliberately set up. Um, it says in the works of Josephus, it was set up by um, uh, Herod Herod, one of the Herod tetrarchs. But I rather think you know, that the fingerprints of Rome would have been all over this rather than just the Herod Tetrarchs. And what they wanted was a buffer state between Rome and Parthia, because there've been so many uh, battles and, and border disputes between Rome and Parthia. It suited both of these empires to have this buffer state between them. And that was Edessa. And specifically, they were given this region um, which is all down this sort of eastern board of, of modern Syria, all the way down to uh, Palmyra and almost down to Damascus. They were given this region tax-free. And that was the whole reason for the, the, the later um, Jewish revolt and all of the problems within the gospel stories, because Rome suddenly wanted to tax them. 
but they were a tax-free state. That was the whole point. They were there to guard the borders between Rome and, and, and Parthia, and now Rome wanted to tax them. And so we have this great tax dispute, which you see, in, obviously, in the Gospels. You know, render unto Caesar uh, what belongs to Caesar, but render unto uh, Thea, render unto God what belongs to God. And, of course, his mother was, was uh, or grandmother, was called Thea Musa Orania. So when it says render unto God, is it saying render unto God or render unto Queen Thea? We don't know. I mean, these things are easily retranslated. It's the same as when they say, um, my father is in the kingdom of heaven. Well, of course he was, because Edessa was called the kingdom of heaven. That was its name. Its, its, its name was um, the... Um, the kingdom of Orania, because the queen was called Orania, that was her name. So, and it's still called that now. It's called the Haran even now. So it was known as the kingdom of Orania, the kingdom of heaven. So when he's saying my father lives in the kingdom of heaven, well, of course he did. He lived in Edessa. It's a very easy and simple change to make to read the text in a different fashion entirely. This word Irania, uh, can you spell it for us? And uh, with O U O U, it's it's Greek. It's the Greek for heaven. And is there other uh, so words if... that we use today that are <clears throat> cognates and related in some way? Oh, I I, I imagine so. Um, yes, because it comes out. I trace this uh, a lot further on in an in another book to uh, or meaning gold which is the Latin for gold, because later civilization, later kingdoms and princesses were known as ore, orange. So we have the kingdom of orange in the south of France, which I link into the, uh, the flight of Mary Magdalene and uh, Martha into the south of France. And they founded or um, yeah i think they probably founded orange which is in the south of france it's a city it was a just like edessa it was a separate city state in the south of france called orange and their symbol was the orange which was derived from ore meaning gold the golden ball which is of course a reference to the sun and orange is is the sun and their queen was called Queen Orable, the queen of, queen of gold, the queen of the sun. Um, and it was from those, um, the kingdom of orange in the south of France, that the Dutch princes of orange were derived. So they all came from Fran France. They were all French, but they were exiled to Holland and they formed the kingdom of Holland uh, and the princes of orange in Holland. So I think there is a link there that, that there is a continuation of this terminology and this, this symbology all the way through into the modern era. Um, and of course, the princes of orange are all ginger. Um, one of the things I've said all the way through my books is that uh, the pharaohs of Egypt were ginger. We know that from the analysis that's been done of the mummies. Uh, Ramesses II was uh, pointedly ginger. Uh, Queen Cleopatra was ginger. We have the pictures of her from Herculaneum and from uh, uh, Pompeii. And Jesus, I say, was probably ginger as well, because the Dead Sea Scrolls say that the, the Messiah will be ginger with freckles. Okay. And I think that's a yeah, so well, they dress it up in different languages. It's, it's been um, translated very badly, I think, because it says um, he will be barley with uh, lentils, uh, red red barley with with lentils. But barley, the same word for barley, means hair, because of course barley is a very hairy seed. Uh, so he's got red hair and lentils. I mean, what does a person with red hair have? He has lentils all over his face. It's a perfect analogy. I think it's talking about 
um, orange uh, ginger hair with freckles. Um, <clears throat> and of course, later on, when we go into Islamic history, it was said that Muhammad had ginger hair. That's why if you go out into the, you know, the wilds of Afghanistan and Pakistan and places like that, you will see these Muslims with bright ginger hair, which they've dyed bright ginger. You know, why do they do that? They do that so they look like Muhammad, who also dyed his hair ginger. Why did he do that? Well, because he wanted to look like the previous prophet. And the previous prophet was, of course, Jesus. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a strand of ginger that goes all the way through this. And this was proven later. And I love the way my work does this sometimes. Many times, actually. Many, many, many times. Is that later research backs up what I've said in the past. So I said that, you know, Jesus was ginger. And he looked like an Edessan king. So on the on the cover of my book, Jesus, King of Edessa, I portray Jesus in the fashion that I thought he was, which was a king with a diadema headband, uh, ginger hair and beard, um, because he was a Nazarene. The Nazarene wear their hair long and long beards, the same as the Edessan monarchs all have long hair and long beards, uh, in Roman armor and with stockings because the Parthians wore, wore stockings, whereas the, the Romans did not. And then lo and behold, four or five years later, they uncover the Hukuk mosaic in Judea. So this is another of these synagogues with mosaics all over the floor. And it has, you know, little pictures from the Old Testament building of the Tower of Babel and things of that nature. Um, and one of them is of this king presenting a sacrificial calf to the high priests of Jerusalem. And I looked at this and I knew exactly what it was the first time I'd looked about it because I, I'd already written about this in my book five years ago, Jesus King of Edessa. So I knew exactly what this, this mosaic uh, was trying to portray. And then I read it, it, this was in National Geographic, and I read this and it was uh, done by, who was the archaeologist? Anyway, <clears throat> they were all Jewish archaeologists, one from America and then a team obviously from Israel who were uncovering these mosaics and interpreting them and um, writing up the history of these mosaics. And they said this was an image of Alexander the Great, who, who visited the, the high priesthood, of course. Uh, we know that from Appian. But I'm thinking, hold on a minute. I mean, what planet are these people on? The king in this mosaic has a piot, a curly side lock of hair, a Jewish side lock of hair. Alexander the Great Jew, I mean, it's... it's Absolutely. Rid and he has long hair and a beard, of course, um, which Alexander never had. He, he, he was uh, clean shaven. Um, it was a completely ridiculous um, analysis of this particular mosaic. So what was this particular mosaic? Well, it was the story of Barkamza, the guy we've already talked about, who, who I link up with the biblical Jesus. Um, because the story of Bar Kamsa was that Bar Kamsa caused the Jewish revolt. And he did so by taking a sacrificial calf from Emperor Nero to give to the Jerusalem priesthood in order to upset the Jerusalem priesthood to make them reject the calf because it was a Gentile calf. It wasn't a um, a sacred calf and send it back to Rome and offend um, Emperor Nero and thus foment the Jewish revolt. And that's exactly what this mosaic portrays. It portrays this king giving the sacrificial calf to the, um, uh, to the Jerusalem priesthood, who are obviously not impressed because they're all drawn with their swords. <laughs> ready to strike and you think well hey, this is Barkhamza come on this is Barkhamza um, 
uh, and I, of course, for many reasons, I link Bar Kamsa with the biblical Jesus, uh, with the kings of Edessa. And how is Bar Kamsa portrayed in this particular mosaic? Well, he's got a diadema headband. He's got ginger hair and ginger beard. He's got Roman armor. He's got a, um, a purple cloak, <laughs> the same as Jesus had, fastened with the fibula, exactly the same as the Edessan kings. And he has stockings. Um, it's pretty obvious that this guy is uh, Bar Kamsa from the Talmud, who I equate with the biblical Jesus. Um, and yet the archaeologists and the theologians, the rabbis on this dig site, don't know that. And worse than that, in a way, is they don't know that because they sold this story to National Geographic. <clears throat> So this image was withheld for two years, apparently. So they'd, they'd dug it up a couple of years beforehand, but they put an embargo on the image of this particular uh, zodiac, uh, zodiac, this particular mosaic, so they could sell it to National Geographic. And of course, you can imagine National Geographic didn't want discovery of Barkhamza. Bahu. <laughs> it's not exactly a very catchy headline, is it? What National Geographic wanted was discovery of the mosaic of Alexander the Great. And that's what they sold it as. So it came out into the press as the mosaic of Alexander the Great. But this is just a complete distortion of academia and history. Because anyone who, well, she didn't seem to know. I wrote to the chief archaeologist and um, she didn't seem to have read the Talmud at all. She didn't know anything about Bar Kamsa. <clears throat> so they've completely distorted history because they wanted to sell uh, an exclusive to National Geographic. This is the trouble with um, modern academia. It's, it's been distorted and it's been bought by the highest bidder which is very unfortunate. But anyway, what we have here is in this synagogue, we have what you might expect to have in a synagogue. You have all of these dramatic events from the Old Testament, you know, all in mosaics. And then the final one is the final dramatic piece of history from Jewish history, which is the start of the Jewish revolt. And it was Bar Kamsa that started the Jewish revolt with this sacrificial cow. And you can see him, you know, with this cow giving it to the um, high priests of um, Jerusalem. It's, yeah. To relate it to current Israeli world conflicts, uh, there's a lot of talk about the red heifer. Uh, it seems odd that the end of the uh, classical Judaic period was with a cow, a calf, and now we're talking about the end of the world or the ushering in of something, new millennium or something, with all this yammering about the red heifer. Is there any... I don't know anything about this. It, just, it seems you know, odd to me. No, I've, I've not researched that, but you're right. Yes, that, that is a part of it. Um, perhaps I ought to link that in somehow, that... <clears throat> somehow maybe this this calf became emblematic of of what happened you know not only at the start of the jewish revolt but also the new age of pisces because remember this was the 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 dawn of the great month of pisces only happened in ad 10 it was just that's why jesus was the um the fisher of men he was the first king of pisces that's why in Arthurian legend, we have this story about the line of fisher kings. They were all kings of Pisces. They follow on from, from the gospel era. Um, yeah, it's all sort of linked. So perhaps I ought to just sort of say why I think that this Edessan king was the biblical Jesus. It's because, well, firstly, it's because he was the leader of the Jewish revolt. So as we've said before, I've already linked Jesus with the Jewish revolt because he was obviously involved in a revolt of some sort. We've already 
relocated his era from the 1830s to the 1860s. Um, so he's in the right era now. And what else is there? Well, he's named, there is a Jesus named by Josephus. And that's sort of a smoking gun that needs to be explained. Actually, you mentioned in your books several Jesuses. That's one of the problems of this whole story is that we have too many Jesuses. Well, again, we have this multiple name business, yeah. So Jesus of, of Gamala and Jesus of Sapphias are the same person, I'm pretty sure, because Jesus Sapphias was another leader of the revolt who was the leader of 600 fishermen. Well, who was the leader of 600 fishermen in, in, yeah. <laughs> in this era? For goodness sake, this was the biblical Jesus. Um <clears throat> But Josephus also mentions these kings of Edessa. And he does not call them Jesus. He calls them King Izates. And okay, that was interesting. It's obviously linked in some fashion because he's the leader of the Jewish revolt, the same as Jesus of Gamala was the um, leader of the Jewish revolt. It's got to be linked somehow. And then I read it in the Greek, <clears throat> and it doesn't say Izates. Well, it does sometimes. But more often than not, Josephus calls him by a nickname, a short name, uh, which was Esus. And that's always been translated by Whiston into Isartes on every occasion. But that's not what he calls him. He calls him King Esus. Well, OK, now we're coming a bit closer to the gospel story, because what I think happened is that the name Jesus does not come from Joshua. Because this guy came out of Persia. He came out of Parthia. And Esus is a Parthian name. And so I think the name Jesus was actually derived from Esus, not from Joshua. And that's why if you go into Arabia today <clears throat> and even Syria, any of the Arabic languages, Jesus is called Isus or Issa, which comes from Esus. It doesn't come from Joshua. So the leader of the Jewish revolt was this king of Edessa called Esus. Well, even better than that, <clears throat> we have this strange prophecy in Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to quote this because it makes much more sense. It's a prophecy that doesn't make any sense. So this is Matthew 1, 23, and it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. And okay, on the surface, it's just a prophecy. But it's a prophecy that makes absolutely no sense, because Jesus was never called Emmanuel. So the whole reason that he was going to become the Messiah was because he was going to be called Emmanuel. And then nobody called him Emmanuel, in which case he's not the Messiah. You mean not in the Gospels? Nobody in the Gospels called him Emmanuel? No, nobody in the Gospels ever calls him Emmanuel. That was something that I noticed as a kid. That seemed odd. But... Isn't that something mentioned in the Old Testament? Isn't that the reason it's a prophecy? Is that this is this was way back? Yes, this is this is Pesha. So it comes it's a prophecy based on Old Testament events where there is um uh, a, a similar quote uh in the old uh, a similar verse in the Old Testament which says much the same. But this is this standard Pesha where you look in the Old Testament for similar events. And you can use those old events to predict what will happen in the future. But they, Pesha only works if the characters are similar, if they have similar names um, or similar attributes. Uh, and on this one, it's, it's perfectly clear that his name has to be Emmanuel. Otherwise, the Pesha prophecy doesn't really work. And, of course, Jesus was never called Emmanuel. And so he was not the Messiah. I mean, it's, it's totally meaningless. Um, the whole of the gospel story falls down, you know, almost from, you know, the first chapter in Matthew. So what is this meaning? Again, it's very, very simple, but only if you understand the history behind it. 
And the link here is that the king, or, well, he was the prince who became the king of Edessa, was called Manu. And so the king of Edessa was called Jesus Manu, and Jesus was called Jesus Emmanuel. So now you can see what they were doing with this Pasha prose. They were using it to identify who this king was in real history in a form and a fashion that nobody would understand unless you've been initiated into this particular secret. They will bring forth a son and his name, uh, and they shall call him Manu, the king of Edessa. Well, okay, now if we're initiated, we can all understand what this actually means. But this is not something that Saul Josephus cooked up. This is probably something that was cooked up by the Essenes and the Nazarenes. They're the ones who probably had this idea, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm sort of losing my voice here a bit. Yes, uh, uh, I mean, that's quite, quite possible. Uh, that doesn't appear... Uh, in the works of Josephus. Um, but there are many people who were involved in this tradition and wrote these texts. Even within the works of Josephus, you will find that they've taken multiple sources and fitted them together. And it's quite obvious that this wasn't just Josephus writing himself. He had, a, obviously, a team of scribes who were putting this together into his history. Because you, you often get situations where um, there are duplications because the same story has arrived from two different scribes and they've put it together in the same story within Josephus. But Saul was also working with the Nazarenes. Yes. And you say that he was raised or educated by the Nazarenes or the Essenes or somebody. So there was a, and they're also related. Yes. They're basically cousins in your, in your book, right? So this is a very complicated set of relations oh yes well we've already we've already demonstrated that um, that saul josephus was the ambassador of edessa so he must have been linked to the princes the monarchy of edessa because he was their ambassador it says so in acts of the apostles and i think he was linked to the essene because when i went to qumran which was the center for the essene on the dead sea it was sort of quite obvious to me that this was a yeshiva. It wasn't a monastery. This was a, a boarding school for kids. You know, traditionally within Judaism, they still do it today. Orthodox Jews will be sent off to a boarding school. There's, there's one down the road from me, um, old manor house in the middle of nowhere. And I was just trying to turn my car around because I got lost. Um, <clears throat> typical problem with, with GPS sites. And suddenly I was surrounded by Orthodox Jews in the middle of nowhere. What I didn't realize, of course, is this was a yeshiva in the middle of nowhere, this, this big old manor house. And obviously Jews from all over Britain come into this particular yeshiva. They did the same in, in uh, the first century as well. And I think that uh, Qumran was a yeshiva. It was a boarding school. That's why all the desks and the seats are so so small. That's why there are so many texts with spelling mistakes in them because they were uh, comprehension um, uh, lessons for, for the children. But of course, once you've written out a text within Judaism, even if it's imperfect and written by a child, uh, you can't destroy it because it's semi-sacred. It's the word of God. And so it has to be packed up and put in a pot and thrown into a cave somewhere because you can't destroy it. And that's why I think um, it is quite possible that Saul Josephus ended up in uh, Qumran as a student. And that's where he was educated. He, he goes into some detail about his education, how he had a, an education into all of the sects of, of Judaism. Well, we've got on for two hours and we're probably getting near the limit of something, your voice, once again, yes. once again, your voice, and I don't really want to take too much of your time, but I have a bunch of questions for you that maybe it'll be easier for you to answer, and just a few short, non-stressed <laughs> localizations, and so I'd like to 
because we're not going to get to everything that you've, that you've uncovered. I mean, there's just no way. Uh, people need to actually try reading one of your books. I mean, I, I want to stress that once again, that I'm really enjoying reading your work. Um, but anyway, uh, first, when you started your research, like in the early 1990s, you said, were you any kind of believer in one of these religions? No, no, I've, I've been um, an agnostic or an atheist since I was seven years old. Um, I was just very convinced about this because the stories didn't make sense. Um, the first story that didn't make sense, um, it, it might seem childish, but it was, it was formative in my belief system, was Father Christmas. And I was a firm believer in, in Father Christmas. And then my parents told me that it was a lie. And I was disgusted. I was utterly disgusted that they had lied to me all of this time. And not only that, I immediately connected the story with, with the biblical story as well. If you can have adults telling you one lie, you can have them telling another. And that was very formative in my uh, uh, very early atheism and rebellion, because I was brought up like you in a, a, a Christian household, although not terribly um, uh, we didn't go to church um, you know all the time. We, we did the standard. Were you Anglican or were you a Catholic? Were you pro some other Protestant? Yeah, Anglican. Okay. Um, Church of England. So that was very relaxed in, 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 in the first place. Right. But um, yeah, so uh, I, when I started this, even from an early age, I had no particular bias apart from wanting to get the truth out of it, to get the historical truth out of it, come what may. Because it, it doesn't really matter to me what, you know, various people say about the text or believe about the text um, that did not matter whatsoever. And that sort of freed up my mind and my research to be able to take anything as being a possibility. And that was helpful. Otherwise you cannot do this research. As, as I said, anyone who's read the works of Josephus must have seen pretty much most of what I've seen, but they've, rejected it because it conflicted with what they've been told and what they believed. And here we get to my second question. Uh, and this is, this is kind of what we're very similar to the one that I asked last time, which was about conspiracy. But we got down to this really weird thing where human beings can suppress information. How could the quest for historical Jesus movement, which began in earnest in the 19th century, I mean, in a big way, with the Germans especially. The Germans are still the big scholars of early Christianity and uh, Islam as well. They've done amazing and quite astounding work in Islam recently. Uh, we're having a hard time finding Muhammad, too. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one of our weird little things that we're discovering. <laughs> um, but uh, So how could they, all these scholars, I mean, we've read many, I mean, I've read many historical Jesus texts. How do they actually get away with not seeing the chronological chasm, as you call it? It's right there in Josephus and the Bible. That one is so obvious that, yeah, how, how can they overcome it? They deliberately turn a blind eye to the evidence. And this is, is, is quite plain and quite positive all over that they deliberately don't see the evidence. And it happens all over the place. It happens in, in Arthurian legend as well, where uh, Nietzsche, who's, who's one of the uh, fathers of um, research into Arthurian legend, comes across these passages, which amazed me when I first saw them, but there we go, uh, which say that Arthurian legend was written by Josephus Flavius. And you think, oh, hold on a minute, <laughs> hold on a minute. I mean, that's just crazy. And so what they say is, um, this is obvi obviously a mistake, and it's an error in the text, and then they just go on. But it's not an error in the text. Um, there is a fundamental problem here, and they do the same with the chronological chasm within the Gospels. Everybody knows that there is 
a chronological chasm. That's why they say that the Gospels were only written in the AD 70s, because they cannot match it up with anything in the AD 30s, and they know that a lot of the material was taken from Josephus Flavius, especially in the Gospel of, of Luke and in Acts. And so they have to just declare that there was an oral tradition that was only written down in the AD 70s. But that's just a cover-up. That's not addressing the problem. The problem is that the material comes from the AD 70s. And therefore, well, does the story come from the AD 70s as well? Well, it's quite obvious to me that it does. Uh, but they cannot admit that because it goes against every church teaching that Jesus died in AD 30. But many of these people are as atheistic as you are. Yeah. Mark Ehrman doesn't believe anything like this. He's written a book called Forgery, yes. or Forged, yes. I forget which one it is, which he sort of takes a moralistic tone to people who invent things and make up gospel. I, I will have to read Ehrman a little bit more deeply. Um, in all of my research, I've, I've kept myself apart from other researchers, so I don't get influenced by what they say. And so quite often I don't even know what they say. Um, he's one I ought to maybe perhaps read a bit more deeply. I did buy his book a few months ago, but I've not got round to it. But on talking and debating with um, Richard Carrier, he can't seem to see anything. He is trying to... Uh, I'm not sure if he's supposed to be atheist or not atheist. I can never work him out. I think he's Mormon myself, but there we go. Um, he's supposed to be falsifying the gospel story, but he does it on gospel terms. He does it as a part of mythology and trying to destroy the mythology within the gospels. And I'm thinking, oh, hold on a minute. <clears throat> That's not what you want to do. You want to have a look at the history of the gospels, not the mythology of it. And he never, ever does that. And so he cannot see this chronological chasm. Right. And, you know, I, I have read his work and I've followed him a little bit on YouTube. And uh, he seems to be a debunker type uh, very much. That's why he concentrates on the myth. It's like Richie, Ricky Gervais uh, often makes fun of, you know, children's books about Noah. That's one of his great routines. It's a funny routine. But it's really, easy. it's shooting fish in a barrel, uh, to get back to the Piscean metaphors, I guess. But uh, but that's what Carrier does, too. And it's an odd thing, is that some people are just obsessed with de debunking that they don't really try to find the truth that's buried there somewhere. Yes. But they, it's very odd. I mean, his, his proof that Jesus did not exist was because he does this through... Um, uh, his mathematical analysis. Oh, yeah, that Bayesianism. But his mathematical analysis <clears throat> is, is crazy. Well, I mean, it's it's about probability theory. Now, I'm not a probability theory theorist guy. I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but I I know, let's just say, I, I imbibe it on the streets from the, my friends who are, and they, you know, and I, I have two friends who are really into probability theory. So we debate these things philosophically all the time, or at least, you know, occasionally and for fun. Uh, and it seems to me that it's very easy to, to set up false waiting for probabilities if you just discount some evidence entirely. It's very easy to do that. Yeah, which is exactly what he does. He starts off with his initial probability waiting is that Jesus is a mythical figure. And then from that, he bases his the rest of his calculations on the fact, the supposed fact that Jesus is myth mythological. Well, sorry, if he's historical, as I have demonstrated, then your initial assumptions on your probability are completely incorrect to start with. Yeah. But he never addresses, ever, as far as I've seen, I, uh, I have to say I haven't read that much of his works. Um, he never bases his theories on the fact that any of this might be historical fact. Because I think his his rationale is he wants to perhaps undermine and destroy this. And therefore, if he's trying to undermine it, 
how can any of it be factual? And so he disregards that possibility from square one and never indulges in the fact that any of it might be um, historical. Mine, my research is totally the opposite. My assumption is the entire gospel story is factual. The problem with it is it's been covered in fairy dust. It's been spiritualized. It's been modified to suit the Roman audience. It's had all of these changes to it, but the underlying story is purely factual. Now, that's a very, very different research perspective than, than Carrier or even Ehrman is, is trying to achieve. And I'm not sure if, if my results reinforce or destroy Christianity. It really depends on how you want to look at it. My, the, the results of my research is that it's 100% true. Well, you know, apart from the spiritual aspects of it. Uh, in terms of history, it's 100% true. The problem is it's not the truth you want. So the guy was not a carpenter. He was not a pauper. Um, he didn't live in the AD 30s. And he wasn't peaceful. You know, he didn't perform miracles. All of the miracles are explainable. I mean, the classic miracle is the turning of water into wine. Did we go through this? I don't think we did. did we? Yes, we did. We did. we did. So, yeah, that was a, a trick by Hero of Alexandria. So they're all explainable uh, in rational terms. Um, and so it becomes a real history, but not the history that the Christians want. Because suddenly the guy is not a carpenter. That's a mistranslation. He's a Freemason. Um, in, in the Gospels, he's called a tecton. And a tecton in Greek is a Freemason. Um, so he's a Freemason from the Judean Lodge. That's why the raising of Lazarus is exactly the same as a third degree raising in masonry. Exactly the same as the um, ceremony that I went through when I was raised into the third degree. I went through a Lazarus raising in exactly the same fashion. Um, he was a king. He was very influential. They were very wealthy. He lived in the AD 60s. He started the Jewish revolt. That's why he was jailed. He was obsessed with taxes. Yeah, it was a dispute about taxes. <laughs> that's what it was all about. He, that's why he was jailed by the Romans alongside revolutionaries who had committed murder in the revolution, as it says in the Gospel of Matthew. So it all works, but it's not the story that the Christians want. They cannot accept those differences between my historical story and their mythological story and and just very quickly while my voice is actually working for a minute um the connections with the Odessan kings are very close indeed because remember that jesus was crucified while wearing a purple cloak and a crown of thorns now the traditional crown of edessa was a crown of thorns and we have those images on their coins. All of the kings of Edessa wore a crown of thorns. And he would have been dressed in a purple cloak because the whole goal of this Jewish revolt was to take over the throne of Rome. And the symbol of the emperor was the purple cloak. It would make no sense for a carpenter to be stuck on a cross with a purple cloak unless he was a pretender to the throne of Rome. And that makes no sense in the AD 30s whatsoever. But of course, in the late AD 60s, the throne of Rome was empty to whoever could grab it, to whoever had a large enough treasury and a big enough army to take the throne of Rome, because that's how you became the next emperor. And of course, we ended up in this situation in Judea in AD 68 to 70, where there were two combatants. Commander Vespasian and the kings of Edessa, King Isus Manu of Edessa, involved in this huge great war in Judea, not for the throne of Jerusalem, but for the throne of Rome, because the throne of Rome was empty. So, and this was the year of four emperors, remember, four emperors had come and gone in this battle for the throne of Rome. And this was the final battle 
for the throne of Rome. So it wasn't the year of four emperors. It was actually the year of five emperors. And the final one was King Isis Manu of Edessa. But he lost that war. He was crucified as a pretender to the throne of Rome with a purple cloak and the crown of thorns of an Edessan king. And it was Vespasian who sailed to Rome to become the next emperor. It was a battle for the throne of Rome. And if it had gone the other way, then the biblical Jesus would have become the next emperor of Rome. That's why it was such an important story. That's why the uh, Flavian emperors had to change the story and gloss it over and make it into this spiritual religious story instead, because the last thing that they wanted to know was that these people were fighting against Rome for the throne of Rome. And so they covered it all, all up. That's why all of the Edessa monarchs and the city of Edessa, all of that history has been deleted from the works of uh, Josephus, or at least covered up in the works of Josephus. So, yeah, that's the story. That's why it was important. Well, I have a thousand more questions, including a few on my page, but I think we'll avoid most of them. <laughs> uh, avoid most of them right now because it is getting late. Um, but I do sort of have a title for this for this episode of my podcast, and it's uh, The Greatest Conspiracy Ever Sold. Because we are talking about a conspiracy of disinformation. It's a disinformation campaign, and it's an astounding, it's the biggest one that we've come across so far. And very successful. It was Roman propaganda. The whole thing was Roman propaganda. They wanted to neuter these messianic, rebellious Jews in the eastern provinces of Rome. And the easiest way of do it, to do it was to adopt the Gentile Judaism that had been invented by Saul Josephus a Rome-friendly form of Judaism. And that's what they did. One that has people will pay their taxes. One, yes, where they would pay their taxes. And they would turn the other cheek to Rome. Right. And if you read in the, in the um, epistles, there's lots of... Uh, I can't remember exactly what it says, but basically it's saying that uh, the, the emperors are provided by God and therefore you must honor the emperors and all of this sort of business. Uh, that's in the epistles. It's saying, be good Romans. Whereas the Nazarene Jews were not good Romans. Uh, so this was perfect for Vespasian. It was promoted by Vespasian. Christianity got um, the full support of Rome. And this idea that they were being persecuted is because the Nazarene Jews were indeed being persecuted. But that wasn't simple Judaism. That was completely separate. And it took a, a few hundred years before Constantine finally codified the whole thing, made the thing somewhat oh, yeah. coherent. Yes. Uh, before yeah. that, we had, a, we had a Julian the Apostate try to bring back... Uh, bring back a non-Christian pagan Rome. Yes. Well, well, Rome was polytheistic, you know. Um, that was how the Rome worked, and it was very, very successful. Um, Rome didn't care what you believed. And that's why they had this synchronism where they tried to join all of the gods together. What's your god? Your god is a female god, something linked to, oh, well, you must be believing in Isis, Aphrodite. We, we'll just call her Isis. But she's the same god, you know. So they, they sort of conjoined all of these religions together. And every Roman city would have at least three temples. And it didn't really matter which one you went to. You could go to this one or that one or the other one because there were plenty of temples to plenty of gods, depending. And you might visit all of them. You were not necessarily consigned only to one temple. Um, you could visit different ones on different occasions, you know, uh, as long as you were Roman first and you honored the emperor first. Those, those are the only two requirements. And below that, you could worship or believe anything you liked. The only problems, the only people who would not adhere to this um, Roman Empire um, mechanism for producing unity, 
The only people who wouldn't adhere to, to that were the um, the British dru Druids, who they wiped out because they wouldn't adhere to it, and the Messianic Jews. And they did exactly the same with the Messianic Jews, and they tried to wipe them out. Firstly, in the um, uh, the, the Great Jewish Revolt, and then in the Bar Kokhba uprising as well, where they finished off the job. And in fact, they finished off the job with, I forget how many legions they took, but it was an enormous great army on the Bar Kokhba uprising. I think it was something like 100,000 men they threw over there um, to finally destroy Messianic Judaism. Um, but yeah, so Christianity itself simple Judaism, as I, I call it, was perfect for Rome because it was just one of many beliefs um, that you were able to uh, conform to within the Roman Empire. That's that's how the Roman Empire worked. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, Orthodox Christian persecution of the Gnostics? Well, the Gnostics would have held... This was the whole problem of the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chaldean. There were sects, especially out in the east in Edessa, because remember the first uh, Christian city was Edessa, not Jerusalem. The first Christian city was Edessa. There were sects in these regions who understood the original um, history of this region this heretical history of this region, which now conflicted with the story that they had concocted within Catholic Christianity. And of course, they had a different idea about who Jesus was and the history of, of the Gospels. And they were trying to stamp out these heresies, the idea that Jesus was just a man and he was not a son of God and all of this sort of business. The Arians, I think that was, that all had to be stamped out, and that was all done at the Council of Nicaea and then the Council of Chalcedon, which finally spit off the Syriac Church because the Syriac Church did not want to believe that. And so those beliefs, those ideas, that history was cut off from the Western Hemisphere completely until the Crusades. Because a funny thing happened on the road, on, on, on the road to the Crusades. A very funny thing. So um, the first crusade was by Baldwin, um, Baldwin of Boulogne. And he took the first crusade um, across Anatolia into Syria uh, to modern Antioch, uh, which is on the sort of northeast corner of the Mediterranean. And he didn't turn right. So if you want to go down to Jerusalem and free Jer Jerusalem from um, Islamic oppression, you would have to go and turn right down the Levant. But he didn't. The first crusade carried on eastwards across the uh, Euphrates. And what was the first town to be liberated from Muslim control? It was Edessa. So the Crusades went to Edessa. They didn't go to free Jerusalem. They went to free Edessa. And that was the first city they freed from um, Muslim control. Why? Because there were still secrets there. Secrets that have been hidden behind the, uh, the veil of the Council of Chalcedon, the veil of the Council of um, Nicaea, and the Iron Curtain of Islam. Nobody had seen any of those details for 800, 700 years. And if you wanted to know anything about the gospel story, you had to go to Edessa. And that's exactly what they did. So the uh, conspiracy had a problem there with the Crusades. Yeah. Well, the question then becomes is what did they find? You know, right. Why did the Knights Templar have to be created in order to protect those heresies that they found. Uh, it's quite obvious to me that the, the Knights Templar understood pretty much all of what we have discussed here. That was the secret that they were maintaining. 
Uh, and I go through a lot of this in, in the books, why I think the Knights Templar held these secrets. Um, and they divulged a lot of those secrets and we'll perhaps go through this at another time. But they did write down a lot of these secrets, but you will not know it because you've been conditioned not to see it. Even though you've probably read it, but you didn't understand it. Right. So we'll, we'll go through that at another time. The Templar secrets are out there. Uh, you just have to understand what they are, where they are. Yeah, um, and here we get to my, one of my favorite subjects, which is how could we see something and not see it at all? Uh, the things right in front of our face, we're not yeah. recognizing it. Yes. It's, it's the easiest way to hide something is to hide it in plain sight. And that's what they've yeah, done. We have one big purloin letter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like um, the story of. Um, um, oh, gosh, why can't I think of her name? Who was the um, uh, story princess who was locked in a tower? Um, Rapunzel. Rapunzel. Yeah. Who was the princess with golden hair who was locked in a tower looking for her lost prince? What does Magdalene mean? Magdalene means the tower, Mary of the tower with her long golden hair because she's always portrayed with ginger hair because this family did have ginger hair. Um, yeah, Rapunzel is, is a story about Mary Magdalene. But you would never understand it on the surface because it's just a children's story, you know. One of the most famous towers of the ancient world still standing is the tower in Iran. Yes. It's the tower that's on it's the tower that's on the uh, cards, the prognostication cards. What do they call it? The the the, uh, the what is that deck? The, the the deck of cards that Oh yeah, yeah, people... the um Yeah, I know what you're talking about, yes. The um it's the it's a word that we've known all all our lives, and we use yes. you know once or twice a year. <laughs> We're not the kind of people who play with those kind of cards, but uh, but the the, Haran, the 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 tower of death, the tower card. Yes, tower. Looks like the the tower of Iran. Yes, and that's near Odessa, and that what if that were Mary Magdalene's tower? Well, she was the queen of the tower, and there were many of these towers. So I don't know if this was actually related to her at all. Um, the towers were phallic symbols. And I think we've already been through the um, yes. tower of Queen Mecca, where she was um, venerating a phallic symbol. Um, so there were many of these phallic symbols around, which are towers. So if you go to Ireland, for instance, there are many, many round towers in Ireland, which are not bell towers because they've never had bells in. Some of them don't even have windows in the top of them. And they're all associated with monasteries. Why do they have these round towers that s seem to have no function whatsoever? Well, because they are Magdalens. They are towers. They are phallic symbols. And the biggest symbol of this early Nazarene Judaism was the phallic symbol. It was, it was the, the penis of, of Atum, the Egyptian god. Um, and or even the phallus of, of Osiris, the phallus that went missing. Um, this was a part of the ancient religion, which was all absorbed into Judaism and thus absorbed into Christianity. But whether they knew it or not, they were making phallic symbols because that was one of the chief symbols of these religions. And uh, yeah, you'll see these towers all over the place. Um, and there were other towers as well. If you, if you look at a, an Islamic mosque, which, you know, all Islamic mosques uh, are based upon the uh, Hagia Sophia in um, Constantinople. Which was a Christian uh, thing, right? Yes, Christian cathedral. Yeah, the Hagia Sophia is a Christian cathedral, but it's a dome inside four towers. And that was the Egyptian uh form and symbol or symbology of the earth and the heavens. So you had a hemisphere of the earth and the four pillars that held up the skies. And so it's, it's an image of, of the heavens as understood in the, that sort of era. 
Um, so we have that symbology as well. Well, the ancient world is becoming clearer, but it certainly is going through a lot of complexity to get to the simple truth. <laughs> a lot, a lot. And we have a long ways to go. Topic. I have a long ways to go to <laughs> just understand your ideas. And there are more ideas out there that are relevant even unto the present day. Uh, what amazes me, I have to, I'm going to stay again because this will relate it to my, my uh, listeners and viewers, is that this does have some bearing on how... Oh, yeah. uh, how do you rule an empire? How do you rule a people? Well, you do it with propaganda and with a carefully managing the truth and hiding it behind, well, you call it fairy dust. Yeah, because I'm not sure if everyone has this idea, but I had this idea that Rome was maintained and expanded by force. It was only due military action it was it was armies it was suppressing people with with huge o overwhelming force it was only later with with all of this research that un i understood the subtleties of the propaganda that went along with it rome wasn't held together with with military force it was held together with propaganda this syncretism with with amalgamating all of the gods together you know why bother saying you know oh forget your religion your religion is a load of rubbish this is what you've got to believe in well why bother doing that and antagonize everybody when you can say oh well your god here is our zeus it's exactly the same you know so you're actually worshiping zeus it's the same god well that's a much easier way of doing it and then we have all of this disinformation with the um, christian propaganda the uh, gospel story, Roman propaganda of real history. Uh, yeah, so the whole of the Roman Empire was held together with very clever aspects of disinformation and propaganda. Yeah. It's a much more interesting story. Right, and, and, I, and I, that's one of the reasons I have you on, because my uh, friends and my followers, to the few that I have, uh, we are trying to understand the use of force in society. That's one of the things we're, we're interested in. And we think force is very important. However, we also have read our Etienne de Labuetti and David Hume, both of which said that on some important level, everything is voluntary. That is, mm. how you accommodate force and how you accommodate power is where the power really is. And if the way the people accommodate and think about force changes then there's a revolution in the state. And we're right now yeah. in a period of history, I think, where we have two radically different ways of looking at the world that aren't agreeing anymore. And yes. this is going to get very interesting. Yes, because, yes, you, you're ending up with a situation where, as you say, you must have cooperation between the two groups. And now there is no longer cooperation. There is no meeting of minds between the two groups. So, yeah, where do you go to from here? I mean, you're on Gab, mm. which is probably not something you expected to do a year no, ago. because I got thrown off. Well, I've, I've been thrown off Facebook twice. Um, for I, I, I don't even know why, because they didn't explain. But <laughs> I, I have no future on Facebook because I'm going to be thrown off again. And so all I can do is retreat to, well, some people would say it's a far right wing um platform i don't know if it is or not but it's the only platform that will accept freedom of speech uh, and sort of works in a sort of facebook way so i'm transitioning across to to gab um which is sad i was quite happy with facebook but if they're gonna censor everybody which they are doing um i have no future there i had this problem once before uh back in the 90s and 2000s the noughties, as I like to call them, when we had a similar situation in Britain with uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair. And he wanted to institute a um, religious hatred law, which was effectively a blasphemy law. And it meant that anyone could shut me down completely because anyone could take my work as being religious hatred. I mean, it's not. It's not hatred at all. It's just an explanation of history. But if, if, if it conflicts with your belief system, you can easily take it 
and explain it as being hatred and shut me down completely. And so I had to wage quite a, um, a campaign, not myself, of course, there was a whole, a whole raft of people who were in the same situation, who were fighting against this new law. Um, and that included comedians, because they would be shut down completely. If you can't criticize someone or make fun of someone, how can you be a comedian? Um, artists, historians, academics, there were all sorts of people coming out of the woodwork, finally coming out of the woodwork and saying, hold on a minute, you can't do this. You're going to shut down all of uh, research, historical research and theological research and everything. Um, because someone's going to complain somewhere about what you're writing. And it was a close run thing, but it, you know, the bill was defeated in the end. But um, all I can see... But all that's coming back now. It's coming back. And all I can see with the Biden regime is that is coming back within the Biden regime. And you're going to get the same problem. It's going to be covered as, oh, we're just doing this for the good of the people. It's just to prevent hatred. Yeah, but what you're going to get is a blasphemy bill. And it's going to be used by certain people and certain sects to silence any criticism or research into their belief system. And that's very pernicious. It's very, very dangerous. And uh, yeah, I don't like the way that America is traveling at present. I remember when the Salman Rushdie affair came, uh, came to the yes. head. That's where actually this, this blasphemy business came to my yes. attention in England, because that was a big deal in England. And I remember John le Carré uh, coming out and said that no one has a right to blaspheme or make fun of any other religion that's just the, yeah. he, he he actually said that just crazy and yeah, absolutely crazy and and of course my my response i wrote i wrote about it at the time I, I said well you realize that all the major religions make fun of each other religion and they're blaspheming each other religions all the time i mean m muslims aren't nice to christians christians aren't nice to jews and then the gospels jesus said horrible things about the pharisees and the sadducees uh, <laughs> i mean the idea is preposterous yeah and the idea that any learned person who's read a book could hold that I but john le carre is a is was a major literary figure he's not an idiot yeah, but why do they end up on that side of the argument? I don't know, because um, Rushdie had to go into hiding in Wales for six months. So he had to disappear, uh, go, um, what do they call it? Going off grid, I think they call it. Um, two of his editors were killed. Um, no, I think one of them survived. One of them had a panic room. So he'd actually made a panic room in his house, which he fled into and left his daughter still sitting in the kitchen. And luckily they were trying to um, batter down the uh, safe room and ignored the daughter. So uh, he survived. Um, and in Turkey, the worst one of this was all part of Rushdie. And Rushdie never really made an apology for this. They had the more liberal sect of Islam in Turkey, um, the Alawites, not Alawites, the Alevi, they're related. And isn't that who uh, runs Syria? That isn't the Syria. The family that runs Syria is a lady. The, that's the Alawites. So the Alawites run Syria. Oh, I'll do that. Okay. And they, they are again. There are a semi-Christian um, Islamic group. So they're not fully Islamic. They they refuse to go to mosque. Um, this is why I've backed Assad all of this time because he's the only secular leader in the whole of Syria who will protect all religious minorities. The others won't. This is why I was totally against any opposition to, to Assad um, because he's protected the religious and cultural minorities in Syria for the last century, uh, his Alawite clan. And they were trying to get rid of him. And you go, why? He's the only Westerner. He was a dentist. No, he was an optician in London. Fully Westernized, non-Muslim, semi-Christian, because the Alawites, they celebrate uh, Easter and they celebrate Christmas. They refuse to go to mosque. And that's why they're persecuted by the Sunni majority. And that's why the... Um, that's why the... Uh, Revolt started in Syria, the uprising, 
because he's one of the despised minority. The Alawites were the untouchables. They were kept in the gutters of Syrian society for 1,200 years. They were not allowed to have any positions of authority. Uh, and so they lived in the gutters for 1,200 years until the French came along. And the French wanted an ally. Well, who do you take as an ally? Well, you take those oppressed people over there. And so they put them into the army and the, heart, the army became 100% sort of Alawite. And from there, of course, they used that as a springboard to take over control of, of Syria. So the oppressed became the leaders of, of Syria. So the history of, of Assad and the Alawites is totally the opposite of what we've been told in the Western press. He is the oppressed min minority, and he's only there in a position of power because they control the army. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of an a, a aside on this, but I suppose it's related. Well, the Biden administration is set to do exactly what Obama and Hillary wants. They want to go to Syria so bad. The trouble is, if he, if he deposes Assad, the first thing that will happen is that the Sunnis, who used to be the majority, of course, they used to be the leaders of Syria for a thousand years, they will extinguish four million Alawites and they will extinguish four million uh, Christians. So all of the Syriac Christians will be exterminated if Assad goes. Assad is the only protector of the Christians in Syria and all of the other minor sects as well. I'm convinced that our leaders, you know, our deep state leaders, the people who love war so much mm -hmm. in America, I'm convinced they want the Christians to die. I don't know why that's the case, but I think they want them to die, and I'm not sure what it is. But the, in America, they're allied against the normal Orthodox fundamentalist evangelical Christian groups. They hate... I mean, I know it's, it's, a, it's pretty a pretty stark way of putting it, uh, but I see in America the elites, the cognitive elites, really hating normal Americans who, you know, workers, people who go to church. Mm. Now, I'm not one of those people, but I know hate when I see it, and it is very, very strong. Yes. And I think they want them to die. And, and this does happen. Again, that's the, that's a whole new topic to discuss, which we could discuss for, forever. Uh, but coming back to the Salman Rushdie, the same happened in Turkey, because they're liberal Muslim minority is not the Alawite, but the Alevi. Again, they are Shia type Muslims, but again, they are very liberal. They, they love poetry and music and whatever. Um, and they were having a poetry reading session, which happened to include someone who had made commentary on the Salman Rushdie book, the Satanic Verses. And he had written about it. I'm not sure what he wrote about it. But um, anyway, a rabid mob arrived outside. I mean, by mob, I mean a couple of thousand people. I mean, this was a huge, great demonstration. Arrived outside the hotel they were in having this poetry and music evening. And they burnt them all to death. 36 of them were burnt to death. This is the... Um, uh, the not the Hammer Uprising. I remember what it's called. There's a town in eastern Turkey, and it's named after that town. Um, and yeah, that's that was all a part of this Salman Rushdie affair, where we had this blasphemy law taken seriously, obviously in the east, but also in the west. Um, and do we want that coming back again? Um it's crazy that anyone would be backing people who want blasphemy laws in the 21st century because they can be used and abused by the people who really want to use them. So they won't be used by the Church of England because they don't care. You can you can say anything about the Church of England, right. anything about their their Jesus. And they'll say, well, yeah, you know, that's your opinion. But, uh, you know. But you try that against maybe the Catholics or you try that maybe against the Muslims and you will have a very violent backlash. 
and the blasphemy law will be used to silence you and send you to prison and end all research and criticism of what they believe. We don't want that in the 21st century. And if that's the road that Biden's going down, I'm sorry, I'm going to oppose you every step of the way, because that's not what the 21st century needs. No, but I don't think they figured out a way of recapturing, you might say, what I think of as the liberal order. They, they mm. don't have a grasp on it. Uh, and yeah. no group does, really. I don't think no, no powerful group does, as far as I can tell. Uh, they've lost something. And the, the, our civilization has lost something really important. And I'm, I'm very interested to see what they're going to cook up with. What they're going to yes. cook up. Because yeah. It doesn't look good to me, but, you know... I don't get to determine anything. So there we are. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Well, I really thank you for taking all this time with me and, uh, I will set this up pretty soon and, uh, publicize it as much as I can. And, uh, maybe people will understand that the propaganda is an old thing and it's, it's changed our lives and the way we think about the world. And it's still it in has play. Indeed. Yeah. It's great to be with you on your show. So okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Hope it does well. Before I sign off, I should uh, clear up a few things. I made an error, at least one, the one I can think of right now, uh, in my discussion with Ralph, and that is that uh, Julian did not come before Constantine, the great emperor. He came after. I'd forgotten that. And the other is that uh, Ralph was thinking of the Sebus riots, which you're seeing on screen if you're watching right now. And I hope that my regular viewers and listeners have an idea of why I find all this interesting. It's not just history, because I'm very interested in history, no matter what practical or impractical thing it may be. But let's be realistic here. This has relevance for our age. We need to understand how the masses can be manipulated by a few people. In this case, the Flavian emperors paid Josephus to have an operation, a propaganda operation, that yielded two major religions, or the modern versions of one religion. Well, it's a theory. It's worth contemplating because that was a great success. And we shouldn't pretend that we're not being fooled by insiders right now. People of the intellectual bent, we're taught not to believe in any kind of conspiracy. I think we need to give up that conviction. There are obviously conspiracies, and some of them have worked. Some lies are very, very effective. And big lies work, as Hitler's henchman explained, because people can't believe that it would be untrue if you can't get away with a big lie. Because we have this idea that you can't get away with a big lie, therefore the big lies don't work. <laughs> that prejudice against the big lie is why big lies work. That's one of the odd things about social psychology that People who are interested in history and economics, for instance, my two major intellectual passions, have to understand is that it is quite possible to get away with a whopper. <laughs>